couple of girls talk about the sun the get familiar with blue and the charm ones too charm chats welcome to charm chats with kendra and cat woo yeah we're I, at i gotta think of a tagline why for what oh wait no i did think of a tagline before the power of two plus blue nice but that's not really describing our podcast. <laughs> I like it, though. I like it a lot. Thanks, Blue. Did you like my tagline? Did you like my tagline? Why, why are you looking at me like that? <laughs> so, we've made it to episode 202. Mm-hmm. I'm excited and a little anxious about this episode. Yeah. Because this episode is indicative of the need for a continuity master. Mm-hmm. Really is. Yeah. Yeah. So episode 202 is called Morality Bites, and it aired October 7th, 1999. The episode is a nod to and a play on words to the 1994 movie Reality Bites, starring Ethan Hawke, and a tagline for that movie was a comedy about love in the 90s. Which... This episode is not? No, it really isn't. But for some reason, they, yeah. they went for it. I think it's just another case of, hey, this makes pop culture reference. Let's do it. Yep, absolutely. So we start the episode with an exterior shot of the Halliwell Manor. And Piper limp walks into the kitchen mm -hmm. holding some groceries. And one of her shoes. Indeed. She's wearing a long sleeve red top and black pants, and the top was like kind of baggy and loose. It was a little peasanty, a little, but not like bell sleeved. As... Yeah, it was more bell sleeved than than anything. But it it was a little bit like it didn't really look like it fit her very well because it didn't. Yeah, it looked like it was super loose on her, like it was a size or two too big. Mm -hmm. Phoebe is in a cap sleeve top. That has tiny purple flowers on it all over the bust and the bottom of the shirt and a few on the middle of it. Kind yeah. of like it was migrating from the top and the bottom and mm -hmm. heading toward the middle. It was super cute. And the majority of it was sort of see-through. Like when you when we get a shot of her back, we mm -hmm. can see her bra. Yeah. She's actually wearing one. She is indeed. Um, like Shannon most of the time. Yeah. And the front has like a panel or something. And yeah. Because the front is pretty much opaque. Yeah. And the back isn't. Yeah, it's like... It's a cute top. It's I a like really it. cute top. I, I super, super enjoyed it, and I totally would have worn it. Then I would totally wear it now. It was super cute. But she pairs it with purple pants that only go to her knees. And they're really wide leg. Like, when she's walking, they kind of look like they could be a skirt. Yeah, it's, it's kind of odd that... that pant choice. When are the wardrobe choices in this show not <laughs> odd? Yeah, there's a couple coming up this season. There's a couple coming up this episode. Well, yes, but there's a couple coming up this season that I am uh, yeah, greatly excited about. Oh, man. Oh, and then next season. Oh, next season. Yeah, we're not going to talk about next season right now. I know. So, Prue is... In a V-neck, long-sleeve, white shirt. And she has that little diamond necklace on again. Mm -hmm. But we don't see her legs. So I don't know what she's wearing at the bottom. Yeah. At this time. So as Piper is walking in from the dining room into the kitchen, Prue and Phoebe are like, dude, what smells? <laughs> like, what and did you buy? What yeah. did you buy? As Piper sets the groceries down on the counter, she's like, duty. And Prue says, we weren't out of we that. We were out of that, which was the funniest line. And then I... And, and it then, was perfectly delivered. Yes. And Phoebe turns to her and kind of chuckles, which honestly, it looks so authentic. I think that might have been Alyssa breaking a little bit. Maybe. Possibly. Uh -huh, because but it, it was so perfectly it done. It was more authentic than that time that she looked at... That Alyssa looked at uh, Shannon as she delivered something and was like, ah, nice one. Yeah. Like, this was This was a little, like, candid. Yeah. To me. Yeah. I mean, it may not have been, but it it, it, it felt, felt like one, it. Of, the, one yeah. of those unexpected chuckles that just rises up. Yeah, it was perfectly delivered. It was 
hilarious. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. And then Piper walks over to the laundry room and I assume tosses the shoe inside of it and shuts the door again. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Like, I have no idea what she does with the shoe other than she goes into the laundry room and then comes back out without the shoe. Yeah. Still limp walking because she's still wearing one of her shoes. Mm-hmm. I think she just tossed it in there because it's a tile floor and it's easier to clean. Possibly. Uh-huh. But anyway, we learn that the neighbor has been letting his dog use their front walk as a puppy landmine. Yeah. He's letting him, the dog poop on the sidewalk Which, and then not cleaning it up. Oh and as God, a dog on walker. On the sidewalk? Yeah. On the sidewalk. The, like, okay. Yeah. As a, oh. as a dog walker and a decent human being, this pisses me off. Pick up your dog poop, people. Mm-hmm. Because I am so annoyed with how many times the dogs that I walk have found other dog poop and started to eat it. Yeah. And, and what baffles gross. me, what baffles me is the sidewalk. Like, okay, mm-hmm. this is stupid. I, I don't know many dogs who poop on the sidewalk. They all go my for the grass. Do- my cousin's dog will poop on the sidewalk. He'll mm-hmm. poop wherever... Wherever the poop I mean, strikes him. Granted, like but... downtown Chicago, they have all those tiny little fences around mm-hmm. the green areas, so the dogs won't do that. So then you kind of have to. But, yeah. Or if but... you have a tiny dog who just goes in between them and just like, ah, eh, whatever. Yeah. But even then, pick up the dog poop. Yeah. It's really not that hard to pick up the dog poop. Mm hmm. You hold your breath, you get the little baggie, you hold your breath. Yeah. You pick it up, you tie the baggie off, and then you throw it in the nearest and garbage can you see. You said hold your breath twice. <laughs> you said hold your breath, get the doggy bag, hold your breath. Oh, uh, well. So I ended with hold your breath. I was going to cut out the first one. But that's oh, fine. whatever. That's fine. But yeah. I figured it was one of those, like, repeat jokes. No, it was just a... It was just a fuck up on my part. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. They commiserate about the fact that this asshole is doing this. And then, from the front, they hear well, a dog barking. Well, no, no, hold on. They commiserate, and they say that they've tried leaving notes for him, and nothing has worked. I wonder where are they leaving these notes? Probably at his house. But no, because they don't recognize who he is until the end of the episode. I think they know where he walks to, though. I don't know. Just because they don't see his face doesn't mean they don't know where he lives. I don't know. But it's never addressed. They just say, we left notes and everything and nothing's worked and blah, blah. Like, I don't... Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe they have a sign that they've put up a couple of times? Maybe. Possibly. But I... We will never know. Did they say he's a neighbor? I don't remember. Because if they say he's a neighbor, then that means they know he lives on the street, which means they know probably where he lives. But yeah. Either they're leaving notes at his house, or they're leaving notes, like, around where the dog poops. Also, I've never seen a dog poop in one person's sidewalk. Or in one spot that... I like, have. Like, that commonly. I Granted, have. Granted, this one will pee on a spot, walk 20 feet, and then when we turn around, he'll, he'll sniff it again and decide he needs to pee on it again. <laughs> because clearly a dog has peed here and he needs to cover it up, even though it's his. Yep. Yeah, you hear me talking about you. You're ridiculous. Yeah, you are. But yeah, no. The some of the dogs that I walk will will poop in the same general area every day. I mean, he does that when he poops inside because tile. Yep. Because he knows go on the tile. Mm-hmm. Don't go on the carpet. Yeah. But we've never really had much carpet before, so he doesn't really know how to go on it. Which is a good thing. This is true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but Phoebe. Is all up in arms and says she'll give him a piece of her mind. Yeah. And then they hear a dog bark from the front. Uh-huh. So they run to the window, and this is where we see that Prue is wearing a white skirt with red flowers on it. Mm-hmm. It was actually kind of pretty. And strangely work appropriate. Yeah. So they get to the window, and they see a guy with his dog, and they decide to teach him a lesson as a favor to the entire block. At least that's their justification for it. So... Phoebe opens the window, Piper freezes him, and then Prue flicks the poo onto his shoe just actually, before he unfreezes. she flicks it. Like, she doesn't do the hand wave. She flicks it with her middle finger. Yeah. And then 
the guy sees the poo on his shoe, like, tries wiping it off, and as he looks around, they all duck. Yeah, they're like, whoo! And they duck down and hope they weren't seen. So they think that their plan has worked. And as he walks off, Phoebe decides she's deserved 15 minutes of channel surfing for the good deed. Which (laughs) I thought was hilarious because channel surfing isn't a thing that we really do much anymore. I remember remember my, I think my dad getting pissy at me for channel surfing. He's like, no, pick one, stick to it. (laughs) It's like, that's not how that works, dad. Like, when commercials happen, I don't want to look at them. So I go find another channel with stuff I do want to look at. Yeah. I was never really much for channel surfing. Well, I also used to get pissed off at my brother for doing that. But he was a lot... His attention span with that was a lot shorter than mine. Mm. Because he would find something he wants to watch and get bored with it like halfway through. And then just like flip, like flip, watch 10 seconds, flip, watch 10 seconds. And like the, the interval would piss mm. me off because I would like try to get into whatever he was watching and then he would change it. Yeah. And if it was something I wanted to watch, oh, the interval was much shorter. Mm-hmm. I know that feel. Yep. That's, I swear that's a thing that brothers do of, I like this. Oh, wait, you like this? Okay, I don't like this anymore. Yeah. That's what happened with, with me and my brother with metal music. He used to love Metallica and... Megadeth and Anthrax and all those. And the day that he was he was listening to Megadeth and I started singing along because I liked the song and I knew the words, I never heard that song again. He stopped playing it. <laughs> so when he started playing Anthrax, I kept telling him how much I hated the song. So he <laughs> would keep playing it. <laughs> because I loved the song. I enjoyed that band immensely. And so that was the only way that I could make sure that I would be able to hear it again. Because I was too young to go out and buy it for myself. And he already had it. So Mm -hmm. I literally was just like, I hate them. Why do you keep listening to them? And then he put the album on and put it on repeat. And it was great. I got to listen to it all the time. (laughs) Yep, that's that's the good, that's the good good kind of sibling petty. Yep, absolutely. And he never caught on. That's the funniest part to me, is he never caught on to the fact that... Was he a teenager at this point? Mm, Maybe. Yeah, probably. That's probably Because he's three years older than me, so... He was so full of spite. Yeah. That he didn't think. Yeah. My brother's always been a really quiet guy. Well, quiet guys can still have spite. Yeah, but he's never been really much for acting on spite very much. Well, yeah, but look at what he was doing. That is extremely ineffectual petty. Oh, well, yeah. It There's yeah. no consequences. It's not like you stick a bunch of shit on the stairs so people trip over it. True. It's, oh, they like this piece, so I'm not going to play it for you anymore. Yep. That's how I learned all the words to understand, man. Nice. Was because I kept telling him how much I hated the song, so he'd keep playing it. <laughs> and he'd play it louder each time. Sounds good. Yep. It was great. I still enjoy that song, even though I don't really care much for Metallica anymore. But if that song comes on, I'll still listen to Mm -hmm. it. I don't know. It's galvanized in your mind? Yeah, a little bit. A little bit. Mm. I like that pun. You're welcome. I enjoy it. Anyway, back to the episode. Phoebe deserves 15 minutes of channel surfing. Prue and Piper decide to go to the kitchen to get some coffee. And Piper's like, who wants coffee? Prue says, I'll grind. Yeah, it was funny. Phoebe goes to the couch and she lies down, shoes and everything on the couch. Mm-hmm. And they're like these uh, strappy platform sandals. Yeah, they were kind of odd looking. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily in a bad way, but they were just odd. Yeah. So she turns on the TV and the first station that comes up is talking about Coco now having a vocabulary of over 500, and then she flips the channel. And Coco is a gorilla. Coco is the gorilla that was friends with Robin Williams. Okay. Yeah, they met in 2001. There was a there's a YouTube video of them meeting. Aww. It's super cute. Nice. Because she asks him to tickle her. Aww. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's adorable. Yeah. She has a picture book. There was a documentary in 1999, actually, narrated by Martin Sheen. Nice. There was a story about Coco's kitten, because she adopted a kitten, which is apparently also a picture book. Okay. 
Oh, the first documentary was in 1978. How old is this gorilla? She's 45. That's crazy. She was born in 1970. Oh my god, she was born on the 4th of July. Aww. In 1971. Aww. Which means her and birthday was a bicentennial. Nice. Nice. And she's still going. Yes, she That's is awesome. a female western lowland gorilla who is known for having learned a large number of hand signs from a modified version of American Sign Language that they call Gorilla Sign Language. That's nice. It's adorable. That is adorable. Uh-huh. I like it. She knows more than a thousand signs, apparently. Hmm. Well, apparently in 99, she only knew over 500. Mm-hmm. So, she's doing pretty good. Yeah, she is. Mm-hmm. Well, it's been, what, 17 years? Yep. So, yeah. Yep. So... Phoebe flips the station, and we just get a quick gavel coming down and justice today, which I thought was kind of funny, because then she flips the station again, and we get a news reporter talking about Cal Green tying a record by smashing his sixth Grand Slam of the year, and then Phoebe has a premonition of herself being burned alive with her sisters seeing it happen in the year... 2009. That's a decade after the time of this episode, so just let that sink in for a minute. In this episode, the future takes place seven years in our past. Oh, man. That's so weird. Yep. So weird. Mm-hmm. So she comes out of the premonition and cries out. Prue and Piper come running in, and she tells them about the premonition, and then we go to the opening credits. Because that's how that works. Yep. In the opening credits, we have a unique circumstance in that we only see the girls in the opening credits. So there's no Daryl in this episode. No Daryl. And it also tells us that Leo is not a series regular. Because he is in the episode, but he's not in the credits. So he has not been made a series regular at this time. Darn. So the post-credits music on the DVD is Tale of the Sun by Stroke Nine. That's tail as in wagging. Yes. They are an alternative rock band that was formed in the San Francisco Bay Area in 1989. This song was on their album Nasty Little Thoughts, which was released in 1999, and had two hits on rock radio, Little Black Backpack and Letters. I listened to both of those on YouTube and did not particularly care for them. So I think that more just says about my musical tastes more than their music, Mm -hmm. but whatever. I do know that their song kick some ass was in Jay and silent Bob strike back during the montage of Jay and silent Bob flying around the country to attack message board users who had bashed them. (laughs) So I like that. And they also apparently have a couple of songs in the iPhone game Tap Tap Revenge, if anyone plays that. Hashtag not sponsored. Yeah, exactly. And the last album that they put out was in 2007, but they did put out an EP on their Bandcamp page in 2010. Okay. So there's that. Thanks to Shazam. Hashtag not sponsored. Exactly. The post credit song on Netflix was Trials by J.D. Fainer? I think it's Fainer. Yeah, I couldn't find out much about him at all online. (laughs) No clue about anything about him. The only thing I found was his website, and it wasn't that great a website. So, there's that. So, we get a Golden Gate Bridge shot that pans left, then the Coit Tower shot with the birds flying by, and then a new shot of a couple of buildings made out of pillars that have trees and a pond in front of them with a geyser of water coming out of the pond. It looks like it could be a park setting of some sort, and as it pans left, we see there's a walkway around it and there's a bench with people sitting. But we've never had that shot before, and there's no markings as to where that is supposed to be. So, who knows. We then get a shot of the Ghirardelli building, so of course I had to look them up. I love their chocolate. They are the U.S. division of Lint, the Swiss chocolatier and confectionery company. And they are the third oldest chocolate company in the United States after Baker's Chocolate and Whitman's. Baker's Chocolate started in 1780. Nice. Whitman's started in 1842. 
and the U.S. Division, Ghirardelli, started in 1852. So, oh, so Ghirardelli is a subset of Whitman's? No, it's a subset of Lint. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Yep. Fascinating that. Mm-hmm. So, we then get a panning shot with the Oakland Bay Bridge in the background that shows us the Triangle Building before we end on an exterior shot of the manor yet again. In the living room, we continue where we left off before the credits started, with Piper asking why a report about a baseball player would trigger a premonition like that, but Phoebe has no idea. She does know that she could actually feel the fire, which again shows that her power is growing, because we first saw her feeling pain in a premonition back in the Alcatraz episode last season. The doorbell rings, and Piper goes to get it. Because apparently, it's Leo! Yeah! He's wearing a brown plaid shirt over a gray t-shirt and jeans, which is kind of reminiscent of the outfit that he wore in episode 121. Mm Mm-hmm. A little bit. A little bit, because the plaid over gray. Yeah. He's worn that combo before. Mm Mm-hmm. But it was a different plaid shirt, I think. Fairly certain. So they have a cute little interaction, and then they hug, and then Piper starts to use the old save the world excuse. Can't go on our date. We have to save the world, you know. And then the white lighter's noise happens to Leo. And And he's, like, kind of talking to the ceiling, and Piper's looking (laughs) up at, like, what the fuck is happening? Yeah, it was kind of funny. Like, you're looking up, there must be something up there, but I sure as hell can't see it. Yeah. It was It was adorable on her part. Yeah, mm-hmm. it was nice and space then, work. And then she's like, yeah, we need to talk about stuff and figure out where we stand. They need mm-hmm. to have a DTR. D- Define the relationship. Yes. Talk. Yes, they do. And Indeed. Leo's like, rain check? She goes, it's what we do best. Yeah, it was cute. And in and the middle of the goodbye kiss, he orbs out. Yeah, which apparently he's done before. And so she hates some... it when he does that, and I think that's adorable. Yeah, so there's clearly some missing interaction that we haven't seen, because last episode, Piper was really frustrated because she hadn't seen Leo in a while, I think. Wasn't that mentioned? Was that last episode? Well, that was the premiere episode. Like, Leo's yeah. been AWOL, effectively, from her at least. Yeah. She hasn't seen him in a while. Yeah. But it, the last episode was only a month before... Or a month after. Mm. But they clearly... So... Because she knew he was coming over. Because when she hears the doorbell, she's like, oh, that'll be Leo. Yeah. Like, they made an appointment to have a date. Yes. And he didn't just randomly orb in. Yeah. So, yeah, he's being polite. Yeah. That's nice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But anyway, so... We got to the attic mm-hmm. where Leo orbs on in. Yeah, and, and his hands start to glow. His hands glow, and he's doing, like, this marionette pose. Yeah, it was kind of interesting to watch. As he is, without touching it, he starts flipping through the pages of the Book of Shadows. And it's really it's really weird, because it really does look like he's holding a couple of marionettes. Yeah, a little like bit. He's, he's, like, and he's, moving, he's his moving his fingers. As yep. though he's moving typing his phalanges. His dancing phalanges. Dancing phalanges. Yeah, wrong show, but yes. I know. <laughs> Thank you, Bones. Yeah, and then we hear the... Girls coming up the stairs. So he disappears. He doesn't leave. He just kind of goes invisible. No, no, he orbed out. No. It, I thought it looked like no. he orbed out. No, because the pages keep turning. Well, yeah, but that could just be them stupid being like, yeah, we're going to keep doing this. But it looked like he orbed out. Are you going to check it real quick? Yes, I am. Okay. Because I don't think he orbed out. I think he just kind of disappeared. Chat, chat, chat. Orbed out. Oh, yeah, I guess it does. All right. So yeah, he orbed out. But the pages keep turning a little bit, and Piper sees the pages are turning and mentions it. Yeah, she goes, they're doing that flipping thing they do kind of thing. And I'm like, didn't they learn that Grams was the one that did that? Well, they mention it later in the episode. Yeah, they mention it later, but, but she seems to be confused as to why they're doing that flipping thing at this point. Well, at at this point, yeah, that would be confusing. But no, a lot of time, if, Well, okay, like... It kind of becomes the convention in the show that they'll talk about something and go, oh, I'm never going to find blah, blah, blah. And that is the impetus for the pages to flip. They usually have to be in the room and saying something or trying to walk out of the room after going, I can't find a damn thing. And 
then the pages flip. There's usually a verbal cue I that guess so. gets Grams to go, oh, let me, just let me. I guess so, but I just... Except she doesn't say that. Which no. would be funny. It would, but no. I don't know. It's just weird because she seems confused by the pages flipping, even though we it has been established that they know that Grams is the one flipping the pages. I think she would just be confused that they're flipping before they've even tried looking for anything. But the pages have flipped before when they haven't been looking for Well, usually for when they're stuck, not before mm. they even attempt something. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. That's why so, we're arguing about it. Because exactly. it doesn't matter. Exactly. So they go to see what page the book has landed on. And there's two spells, one to take them to the future and one to bring them home. But they only get one shot to use it. Once they use it, the spells disappear. Mm -hmm. And there's some pretty calligraphy on both of these spells. Mm -hmm. They are nice. It's, it's super, super nicely drawn. Mm -hmm. So, Phoebe's worried about time traveling mm -hmm. because when they went back into the 70s, they almost died. Yeah. And that would be a cause of concern. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And they kind of have a bit of a back and forth and, you know, they figure out, you know, going to the future is probably the only way to find out why Phoebe's being killed. So Prue grabs the Book of Shadows and brings it over to a little table that's on the attic floor and asks Phoebe for a date to go to. She gives them the date of February 12th, 2009 which is two weeks before the date that she saw in her premonition. And we get a little insert shot of Phoebe writing the date on a piece of paper that was just, you know, a la convenience sitting on the table. Mm -hmm. But she writes 2-12.2009. Who writes a date like that? I don't know. It was just so weird. Yes, I agree. So weird. Uh -huh. And then Piper's like, wait. What do I look like? Yeah, she. it is one of the funniest moments in this scene. She's like, she wonders what she looks like in the future because of all the wear and tear of a decade of vanquishing. And I just thought it was hilarious. It felt more like a line Phoebe would say. Yeah, a little bit. A little bit. But I guess because of Phoebe... Because being, Phoebe was the one dying Being the one the dying. Future. She's not, not really like, worried about what she looks like. We want to have like. this com comedic relief line in there somewhere... And, well, Prue's probably not going to say it. Yeah. So the only one left to say it, because Phoebe's preoccupied, that'll be Piper. Yeah, but it was a funny line, and she delivered it well. It was nice. So Prue lights a match and burns the paper, as the spell tells them to do. And each of them says a line of the spell. Hear these words. Hear the rhyme. We send to you this burning sign. Then our future selves we'll find. In another place and time. So, after the spell has been said, they disappear into little light bubbles. And all the convenience, the burning paper falls into the bowl on the table. Yeah, which, which then... starts smoking. Yeah. It was kind of weird, because mm. you could tell that it, it was just... A, it was a cute practical effect, I thought. It was a nicely done practical effect, but it was just funny, because you're just like, huh, okay, yep. good thing that bowl was there, you mm -hmm. know. So we then get an exterior shot of the manor where the sky goes through a couple of day-night cycles. Like five tops. Yeah. yeah. Then inside the house, a single large light bubble becomes a few little ones and turns into 1999 Piper over the body of 2009 Piper who is lying kinda, on the couch. Kinda, yeah, she kind of like the, the ghosty 99 Piper kind of lies down in 2009 Piper's body and then turns into the position she's on. Yeah. She's, she's lying down on the couch facing the back of the couch, which honestly is the best way to nap. Absolutely. So nap that way, people. Yeah. And then wakes up. <laughs> yeah. So she wakes up on the couch in the manor. She is now wearing black pants and a white button-down shirt that has an interesting detail of a white strap across it from the right shoulder to the left hip. And her hair is fabulous. I really, really liked her hair. Mm -hmm. It was it's, it's very a full. little longer. It's a little longer. I could Kinda see. Kind of wavy. She's not wearing a wig. I think she's wearing extensions. And yeah. they're curled with the rest of her hair to kind of make it blend in. So, because normally, like, the length her hair is curled, it would be much shorter. 
but it's not. So clearly they added a little bit to it and just rolled all of it to make it look like layers. But yeah, her hair's nice and like the, the center bangs are just kind of pulled back for mostly the convenience of it making it look like she doesn't have bangs. Yep. Which is fine. And yeah, it looks well, great. They, and they kind of And like, it actually was a bit of a style in the mid aughts. Yeah, they kind of like turned the bangs into like a mini pompadoury type well, of okay. thing. It was no but bump it, it. No, it was no bump it. But it it didn't look bad no. and it it looks really cute actually. Like oh, yeah. Yeah. it was very stylish and looked nice on her. Mm-hmm. And the point is that her hair is different, so everything is different. Exactly. And then a small child runs in yelling, Mommy, Mommy, Mommy! Yeah, little girl runs in. She's wearing black tights and a dark sleeveless dress over a green shirt that has a flower pattern and like a vaguely rainbow trim Mm -hmm. on the neckline. It was a very 70s shirt. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. So this little girl is played by Clara Thomas, and she only has two acting credits. She was in this episode of Charmed, and she was Little Girl at Lake in the movie What Dreams May Come from 1998. Another Robin Williams tie-in. Indeed. The only things that I could find on her was that she's an only child, she was in a print ad for Nestle at some point, and her dad is a sound editor. Was her dad a sound editor on Charmed? I don't think so. That would have been interesting. Yeah. I honestly don't know. And then we could ask him about that jaguar roar. Okay. With the ring. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. Piper, hearing this little girl saying, Mommy, says, I think you may have the wrong house. Certainly Certainly the the wrong wrong mommy. mommy. Yeah, it was super cute. And the the little girl hugs her and says, Stop fooling, which again, was adorable. Yeah. So adorable. And then a car honks, which means the carpool is here, and the little girl runs off, and Piper... Looks in the mirror, which I love the little, order. Ooh. I I love the order of the things she fiddles with because it happens. She fiddles with her hair, and then she fiddles with the strap on her shirt, and then in fiddling with the strap on her shirt, she sees the ring on her yes. finger, and she's like, "Ooh, yeah." When she's first just looking at her hair and, and her clothes, she's like, "Ooh," and then she sees the ring, and she's like, "Ooh." Wrong hand, whatever. But it was like <laughs> for those of you that can see the visual, can't use the wrong hand unless she's Greek Orthodox. Yeah, I. It was the hand that was in front of me, so it was the hand that I mm-hmm. used. But she she sees the ring, and it prompts a larger ooh, like a more excited ooh. And it, yeah. was, and it was a really big ring. It was. Like, it wasn't... I think it, it was another band, too. Like, the there was the engagement and the wedding band, I yeah. think. Yeah. That was cool. Yeah. And, of course, then in and the it mirror... Was a, it was a big as diamond, she's staring, too. As she's staring at the ring, she sees a reflection in the mirror of the TV, which has a report about... Phoebe. Yep. So she is like, she oh, turns Phoebe, around. Where, where's the volume? And as she's looking for a remote, the, the TV says, command, recognize. Yeah. Like and then some lady just, robot voice. Yeah. And, and so then it, it just gets louder. Volume. Except what I love about this is you look at this TV and it's clearly like one of those big flat mm-hmm. tube screens. Yeah. Like it's not a flat screen. It's yeah. No, it's a large screen indeed but i just think it's funny that look at the font on the volume thing that's old style oh yeah absolutely that's that like they didn't they didn't bother to think oh maybe because now you look at tvs and when you up the volume it's not those green letters but the tabs yeah so it's just funny to me yeah but i think it's interesting that they thought that 10 years in the future your tv was going to be voice activated also the tv itself has buttons yeah which we've kind of phased out by now yeah, a little bit. But yeah. It was very, very interesting. So the reporter is saying that the news of the execution of Phoebe Halliwell will be coming up after the reg- regularly scheduled programming of MTV's Real World 18 <laughs> on the moon. <laughs> yeah. I laughed so hard that I had to oh look up God. the real world. Yeah. Because there is a show called Real World. It started in 1992. It is still going today. And the actual series in 2009... So that would have been 18. If, it, if they'd done one a year, that, that probably would have been 18. No. No? No. That's what I said. It, the one in 2009 was Real World Brooklyn, and it was the Ooh. 22nd season of the oh. show. Because they didn't do one a year. No. The 18th season of The Real World was in Denver, Colorado, and that was in 2006. They are now up to season 32 in Seattle. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Mm. But I just thought it was very funny that they thought 10 years later, real world 18 was going to be on the moon. 
Yeah, this this episode makes a lot of future mistakes. Feel a bit that the media tends to do. Like when you when you see they cartoons, expect too when you much. see cartoons from the fifties, imagine what the year the distant year two thousand will look like. Yeah. And everything is like fucking on the moon. They're all in silver spacesuits. Yeah. And everything is automated. And you're just like no, but at least, that's mm. But at least that makes a little more sense of fifty years in the future. Yeah. A lot of things are gonna be different. As opposed to 10 years in the future, we're going to have an entire TV series on the moon. Actually, you know what this reminds me of? What? Cleopatra. 2525? Yeah. Yeah, a little bit. But again, that's at least over 500 years in the future. This is true. So that but makes I mean, a little it does, more sense. But it does go into a few of the pitfalls. Like, it doesn't examine some of the, the littler things that might have changed. Because, honestly, look... If you look at just the aesthetic of now versus the aesthetic of, like, turn of the millennium, mm-hmm. the aesthetic hasn't changed overly much. Like, mm-hmm. fashion is a little different, sure. But a lot of the technology changes are just getting slimmer and not necessarily being, you know, ostentatiously different. Yeah. I think Because my... later we see a car drive past the manor and it's, like, black and white and you hear the whir of it like it's supposed to be an electric car. Yeah. And you're like, that's not what a Prius looks like. No, but there are a bunch of different electric mm. cars, so it could have been a Tesla. I know, but it just, it looked like a ridiculous imagining of 30 years down the line instead of 10. Yeah. I think, in, in you brought up Cleopatra 2525, I think for me the thing that kind of annoyed me in that is the clothing. Mm-hmm. Just because you're, they're, they're supposed to be underground and yet everyone is scantily clothed. I'm sorry, it's cold underground. You'd think they'd be wearing more clothes. Well, for how far they fall, I would think it would probably be much closer to the mantle. I don't know, I just... But they're obviously not going to be thinking that because then they have to deal with volcanoes and who wants to do that? Mm-hmm. Anyway. Mm-hmm. Let's not talk about that show right now. But yeah, usually when you're looking at a piece of media from a certain time that is trying to imagine another time, oddly enough, what doesn't change terribly much is fashion. Mm -hmm. The fashion remains mostly consistent, and you can see that in a news report later in this episode where there's a woman reporter, and in the background behind her, there's this one lady in a super baggy suit, and I'm like, that's very 90s. Yeah, it was interesting, to say Mm. the least. So the little girl calls out to Piper, who then tells the TV to shut up, mute, or whatever. And And it responds. It responds by muting, but doesn't actually say anything else. And then she walks to the door, where we see that a woman has entered the house. This woman is wearing a blue v-neck sweater that looks cable knit, and dark tan pants. The actress is Jennifer Hale. She's a Canadian actress who has been acting since 1988, but has mostly done voice acting gigs. This was one of her last physical acting roles, according to her IMDb page, but she's still going strong with the voice acting. Her very last physical acting role was in a TV movie called Shrinking Violet in 2001. Okay. Yeah. Her other physical acting roles include an episode of Melrose Place, Saved by the Bell, The New Class, and Unhappily Ever After, which is a show I've talked about before on this podcast. Mm -hmm. She was also in an episode of a show called USA High that had two seasons from 1997 to 1999 that I thought I had never heard of until I looked up the intro for it. It's about six friends, four Americans, a Brit, and a German, who are enrolled at the American Academy of Paris, which is a boarding school in Paris, France, which is run by a stuffy English principal, because why not? And the intro looked familiar to me, so I kind of vaguely remember it. I'm going to put a link to the intro on the intro video on the website. It's crap quality because it's from the 90s, but mm. you'll get the gist of it. So yeah, USA High had two seasons that were 95 episodes. Apparently, the first season had 75 episodes. Insanity. Yeah, because it was, according to IMDb, it looks like it was an episode a day, five days a week. That's just stupid. Who would watch that? I don't know. I'm. 
it was kind of... Even at midnight, there's only four days a week. Well, but it was kind of like a teenager soap opera typey thing. And soap operas are five days a week. So I kind of understand that logic. But then the second episode... The second season. The second season was only 20 episodes. So who knows what happened there. Probably because they really couldn't maintain that kind of a schedule. Because it's insane. It, it is indeed. It is in but yeah, indeed. That, that intro. Just yeah, the German, so 90s. The German guy is an actual German guy. And he was the cutest out of all of them. <laughs> Which, I swear, that's the reason that I vaguely remember this show. Is because I probably saw promos for it. Mm. And was like, oh, the German's kind of cute. And that was like it. But I don't think I ever actually watched the show. Mm-hmm. Whatever. So, back to Jennifer Hale. Some of her acting voice roles include being the tutorial voice for the Desperate Housewives video game, <laughs> which is kind of hilarious. Oh, that's where I know her from. And, she, yep, she was June and Avatar, Avatar Kiyoshi. Yeah, on Avatar The Last Airbender. She was a bunch of different voices on Star Wars The Clone Wars. And she was Jean Grey in the X-Men cartoon from 2011, which I thought was kind of interesting. And she was in Totally Spies. She was. And she's done a bunch of different voices on Phineas and Ferb, Sophia the First, and the Powerpuff Girls. And most recently, she was the voice of Friday, as well as other voices, in the Avengers Assemble cartoon. Mm -hmm. That's Friday, as in F-R-I-D-A-Y. Indeed. Initialized. Mm Mm-hmm. Because Avengers and Tony mm. Stark. So. They chat for a bit. Yep. Yeah, she and Piper chat for a bit. And we learn that Piper has asked this woman to take her kid to her ex's place. Which... And this woman is like, are you sure you want that? Mm-hmm. And she's like, if that's what I told you to do, then yes. Mm-hmm. But that means that she's still wearing her wedding ring, even though she's apparently not married anymore. Though we learn a little later that she's getting divorced, not that she's already divorced. Mm-hmm. But I'm still not sure exactly how she finds that out because everyone's saying her ex, her ex, her ex. Well, so I don't understand, like... I think she probably assumes. Yeah, that's the only thing I think of is that she's somehow assuming that they aren't actually divorced because she's still wearing her ring. Mm -hmm. But we have no idea who this ex is at this point. Correct, indeed. Who her her baby daddy be. Yep. Well, technically it's not baby daddy if they're married. It, it, it would well, be. they're getting divorced. Yeah, but... So I'd call that a baby daddy. No. I would call that the, that. The the nomenclature of baby daddy is usually when you aren't married to that person at all, ever. hmm Which apparently a lot of states don't have laws regarding custody for single women mm-hmm. because they never bothered to consider that women wouldn't be married while having children. hmm Which is leading to a lot of custody arguments involving assault cases. Which is just lovely. Yeah. Yeah, that's super. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, the the woman asks if Piper and her ex are getting along better now. And Piper says, maybe. Yeah. And then she turns her head toward the stairs and calls out for Prue. And this woman gives, like, a small glance of thinking it's a little weird that she's calling for Prue. But then tells the kid, you know, that they should get going. And the little girl goes over to Piper and she, like, has Piper lean down and says, Don't worry, Mommy. I promise to do as you say. I'll never use my magic again. Yeah. And Piper is clearly, like, alarmed by that. But, mm-hmm. you know, takes the hug the little girl gives her. And then the she runs, runs outside, outside. And she gets into a red car. And Piper goes out to watch them drive off. And the car makes a sound like my Prius does. It's very electric, very quiet. Mm-hmm. So, good on you, ADR people. Yep. I'm I'm actually really proud that in 99, they thought about that enough to be like, in 10 years, we will have quiet cars. We will, you know, like... I think, I think the idea of an electric car had already been percolating for a while. Yeah, but it By wasn't point, as big of a, well, a I mean, thing in the 90s. Like it, no it, one would have owned... I, I don't know yeah. whether or not anyone would have owned one. I don't it know. It certainly wouldn't have been prevalent, and it certainly wouldn't have been cheap enough for your average. Yeah, no, it absolutely... If if they were around, I honestly don't remember, because at that point I had only been driving for like a year, maybe a year and a half, because I got my license the day before my senior year of high school in 1997. Okay. So I'd have only been driving for like a year mm-hmm. and a half in 99. So 
I, I don't know if electric cars or even hybrid cars were a thing. I, I, I don't remember them being a thing, but we all know my memory is shit. So. This is true. Yeah. And I would have been nine. So. Yeah, so you wouldn't have been thinking about it. But no. I'm I'm very, very proud of them being like, yes, this is a thing that will be cost effective for people. Yes. While it is not cost effective now, it will be in 10 years. It's pretty close to cost effective. Certainly more than it would have been then. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's not cost effective in 1999. Well, what about 2009? But that's what they're saying, is that it would have been cost effective in 2009. No, I'm saying it would... And now it is almost cost effective. Yeah. Like most most people could afford your basic hybrid. Yeah. Buy a Prius. They're yes. amazing. They're amazing. Mm-hmm. The gas mileage I know. alone and the fact that it is a 10 gallon tank and I don't have to fill it up at 200 miles, I can fill it up closer to 500 miles mm-hmm. is glorious. Yep. Best purchase I've ever made ever. Yeah. And that includes this Doctor Who sweater. Yes. And your Doctor Who shirt. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm rocking the D-dub. Yep. Yep. And your blue. Totally. And you've got your blue. I've got my blue. Hi, blue. Sleepy blue. You're so sleepy. But anyway. Anyway. As soon so... as this red car pulls away, <laughs> a black stretch limo pulls up. Yeah. Perfect timing. Just absolutely and perfect timing. You look at, you get a shot of Piper's face as this thing is pulling up and she's just like, the fuck? Yeah. It was kind of funny. She has this little moment of like... Uh, is this a thing that happens often? I, I, I don't, I don't know. Uh-huh. But... And then we see a blonde woman get out of this limo, and it just happens to be Prue. And uh-huh. she's got, like, two assistants, one of which is brandishing a briefcase, one of which is brandishing a lint roller, and they're both completely fussing over her. Yeah, absolutely. So, Prue has long blonde hair. With bangs. Like weird bangs that part in the middle. That Yeah, it was yeah. an odd hair and choice. this, okay, what's this extra outfit. funny about this wig, oh. it has visible roots. Yeah. That's strange. Yeah, but I think the whole point was to make it look like it's she natural hair. hair. Yeah. yeah. Which, can I just say, fail. Utter fail. Well, yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm. But yeah, so she has... This outfit. She is wearing a leather skirt with a leather top. That is strapless and kind of handkerchief style. Yeah, it is vaguely handkerchief style in the fact that it is tied in the back and is pointed at the front. But there also seemed like there was like a little bit of extra fabric. Or something. Or something at the chest so that her boobs were actually like covered underneath it. Mm Mm-hmm. It was weird. I don't know exactly how I feel about that particular top. Yeah, it's interesting. Just saying. But she also has the little diamond heart necklace on. So it's nice to see that that's still around in 10 years. Yeah. Right? Right. So yeah, her assistants are fussing all over her and brushing her off and touching her. And then she gets annoyed and tells them to stop. And she has this little moment where she kind of turns and just looks at them and goes, stay. Stay, stay. Yes. Like, it was, like, fun, like, like pointing at them, and, and like, it was very funny. And in subsequent shots of them at the bottom of the stairs, they just had this, like, blank happy look on. Yeah. And just like, oh my god, they're, they're fucking work zombies. Yeah, it was kind uh-huh. of funny. But yeah. So, Piper asked her what's going on, and we learned that Prue doesn't just work at Buckland's, she owns it, and three others in Paris, Tokyo, and London. Which means now she controls her own dress code. Indeed. Which makes this outfit actually work appropriate for the owner. Yes. Piper <laughs> mentions that she's blonde, which Prue agrees is strange. And apparently she woke up at Buckland's <laughs> yes. 20 seconds ago. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. Piper only woke up, like, chronologically. I think we could time it at about a minute, minute and a half tops. Well, I, yeah. So the fact that Prue... See, I would have guessed Prue woke up in the limo and said, hey, course correction, bitch. Yeah, possibly. Mm-hmm. Who knows? But she says that she was in Buckland's, and she's excited about the fact that she has a ton of assistance, a huge office... And a chauffeur that she thinks is so totally hot. Yeah. And she asks how Piper's life has turned out, which makes Piper laugh, and they head into the house. And as they walk inside, we see the three people standing in front of the house. We have the woman with the lint roller, who is wearing a black dress with white cuffs and collar, 
And there's, like, white trim on the pockets. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, so not terribly dated fashion for any date. No, it was actually quite classic. Past. It was quite classic, that outfit. Mm-hmm. The guy with the metal briefcase is just wearing a black suit with a white shirt and a tie that has some sort of pattern on it, but we never get close enough to actually see what it is. So, again, classic. And then, standing by the limo, there's a man with a goatee in a gray suit with a white shirt and a black tie, and he's got a hat on, which I'm assuming is the chauffeur. Yeah. But you don't see his face, so we cannot judge Prue's choices in men that she thinks this guy is so totally hot. Well, but apparently she likes a goatee. That, yeah. Yeah. Apparently we can judge the fact that she immediately caught on to the chauffeur being hot. Yep. They go inside, and Piper is telling Prue about her failed marriage and her beautiful daughter. And Prue automatically fixates on the daughter. Absolutely. And Piper shows her a photo of a kid in a pink ballerina outfit. Tutu, flower crown, the works. Super adorable. Yeah, it was probably one that the actress brought in. Because they're like, hey, do you have a photo of you from something that we could use as, like, a family photo? Yeah, because it, it would be a lot. That's a lot better than the thing that a lot of shows tend to do, which is to Photoshop together a family photo. Yeah, and it always looks horrible. I can think of maybe two instances where it actually looked good. Anyway, <laughs> anyway. So Prue asks what her daughter's name is, and Piper is slightly horrified to realize that she doesn't I know. Don't know. Yeah, it was kind of funny, but it was nicely reacted, like. Oh my god, I don't know. Like, that little realization Mm -hmm. where you're just like, holy shit, I have no idea what my own child's name is. Mm -hmm. Kind of thing. Yeah. And she's like, I really wish we had some memory of what's happened the last 10 years. We thought we were going to come here and watch. Yeah. Not be in our bodies. Yep. Although I understand, like, this would be different because they all have bodies. Fully functioning bodies. Like... It would be, yeah, it going, would to, been, going to the past was a little different. It would have been hilarious had Phoebe, you know, been a zygote. <laughs> Definitely would have been a different episode. Like, you get her perspective, and it's all red and whooshy. <laughs> yeah. If they were actually in their bodies. And then you have to deal with a three-year-old and a five-year-old attempting to, like, use adult language. Which, that would have been tough for the little actresses. But it yeah. would have been hilarious. It would have definitely been a different, different episode. Yes, it would have been a very different episode. Yeah. A little bit. Mm -hmm. Anyway. So then you would be able to deal with the idea of these little girls running away themselves. And then the cops bringing them back to be like, no, we have to go help our mom. Like, oh God, that would have been so hilarious. I can't stop thinking about it now. (laughs) Somewhere in an alternate universe, that show happened. Oh, man. Anyway, yeah. Piper tells Prue that, <laughs> like, Piper's line about, like, I'd love to remember how I got a daughter. And I was just like, um, I think you kind of know how that would happen. Yeah, a little bit. A little bit. Piper tells Prue that her daughter has powers and wonders why she would tell her not to use them, which part of me is like, if you would think about it for just a moment, mm-hmm. you might come to the realization of maybe it's not safe for her to use them. Mm -hmm. just a thought i mean i think the use them ever yes ever i guess yeah because she would be familiar with you know grandma bound our powers to help us but also because like you don't want to deal with children having powers and not knowing when not to use them because they they were there and they saw how they were they're like oh maybe that's why andy's suspicious of us because we didn't know not to use our powers on him yeah. So, like, you can get that, like, children don't have a lot of self-control, and she might get, okay, I won't use my powers while I'm out, but ever would probably make it that much more alarming. I or guess so, actually yeah. it would make it alarming, because it'd be like, wait, never, ever? Like, yeah. even when you're at home? Holy crap, like, that's alarming? Oh no? What? Why? Why would I say that? Yeah, I guess so. Mm-hmm. But... Prue finally realizes that if they are in their future bodies, that Phoebe must be in hers, too. Piper sees the news report of Phoebe on the TV. Yells at it to get louder. The TV gets louder, and the reporter is saying that the burning of Phoebe Halliwell, the witch accused of murdering Cal Green six months before, is set to take place in in eight eight hours. hours. And then they're like... Fuck, we were supposed to be here two weeks ago. Yeah, but then Prue, like, shushes her, which and, I thought was kind of funny. And her bracelet, like, kind of, like, clacks. Yeah. And then the reporter throws the camera to Sierra Stone, 
And Sierra is played by Silvia Vargas with a B. Sibila? It's an odd name. I've never seen it before, so uh-huh. I'm not... Sibila. Sibila. Okay. Sibila Vargas. She or possibly is... Sibila. Possibly. I don't know. She is an actual reporter... She has played a reporter in five different TV shows and two movies. Oh, it's like that guy on Disney Channel. The actor who's a weatherman who only ever wants to play a weatherman. And so he's on all of these, like, Disney and other related things. And it's kind of like this interconnected universe that people are just like, wait, that's the same weatherman from, like, this completely other show from a completely different company. Because he only plays weatherman. Alrighty then. It's hilarious. It's this black guy. I don't remember his name because I never learned it. Here, I'm gonna Google that actually. Yeah, I was gonna say. I think. Hang on, was, I'm wasn't it. he in Parks and Rec? Uh huh. Okay. Okay. That guy who just plays <laughs> a weatherman. I love how that's how you're googling. That's amazing. Why? No, I'm not looking for weatherman. That was not what. I... You want me to look it up on here? Uh yeah, try that. Apparently, the weatherman was Nicolas Cage's last good movie. Yeah, see what I mean? Yeah, hold on. Parks and Rec Weatherman. Purd Happley. That's the one. Yep, Purd Happley. There's an NPR about him. On All Things Considered, I think? I don't know. His real yes, name is you're... Jay Jackson. Uh-huh. News anchor, news anchor, <laughs> I'm news Purd anchor. Happley, and I just realized I'm not holding my microphone. Jackson has also had roles on Scandal, The Mentalist, movies like Fast Five and Battleship, and he always, always portrays a newscaster. Yep. People would say I'm typecast, Jay Jackson says. Well, it's not typecast. It's all I know how to do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's because he spent 22 years as an actual reporter in Southern California. There you go. For some reason, I was pretty good on the death and destruction beat. Like, if someone was murdered or died in a fire for some reason, the loved ones of the victims always wanted to talk to me. <laughs> His change from real news reporter to fake newscaster was, as Jackson says, purely by accident. I run this school called the Los Angeles Reporters Clinic. I help people become reporters by making their demo reels. The demo reels he produces look like live reports where Jackson plays the news anchor and the students are the reporters on the field. One of his clients made a demo reel for a network TV show audition, and the student got the part, and then he also got a call. The manager who saw the tape thought I was great. She was getting a lot of casting calls for reporters and anchors, and the manager asked him if he would be willing to do some auditions. He was a total shoe in That's how you spell shoe in S-H-O-O? I thought it was Mm S-H-O-E. Okay, well, learn something new. His acting debut was a 25-second appearance as a reporter on Dexter. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, man. Yes, Perth Happily is his main one. Yep. It's apparently news anchor is the only thing he even auditions for. Oh, poor thing. Hmm. I'm not, like, some rich guy. I'm still broke. But it's cool, though. I like it. Aww. Aww. Well, apparently his real passion is that he's a jazz singer. Oh, nice. Yep. He wanted to pursue performing jazz, so that's why he retired in 2005. No. Anyway, so, our Sierra Stone actress here, this show was only her second acting gig. Huh. Fun. Yep. So, Sierra tells the camera that San Francisco District Attorney Nathaniel Pratt, whose discovery of the witch last August, has made him an early favor for the governor's seat. And he has just come out to make a statement. And they pan over to Nathaniel Pratt, who is played by Pat Skipper. Oh, man. That's an innocuous name for a guy who looks like a shit show. Well, not a shit show. He just looks evil. He kind of looks like a douche. But it works. He looks more evil than... Fuck, what's his name? Guy who runs a dog rescue, Mexican. Always typecast as the bad guy. Really craggy face. No clue. He's in Spy Kids. And Machete? Machete? No. Oh, yeah. Okay, I know who you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Who's on Breaking Bad. I haven't watched Breaking Bad. Danny Trejo. Yeah. I'm like, I haven't watched enough of Breaking Bad. This guy looks more evil than Danny... More evil than Danny <laughs> Trejo has ever been cast. More emo. <laughs> more emo. <laughs> he looks more emo than Danny Trejo. No, 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 no. No, no, he doesn't look more evil than Danny Trejo. He looks more evil than any role Danny Trejo has ever played. Yeah. So that's saying something. Indeed. He has been acting since 1987. He's been on a bunch of single episodes of shows, including Criminal Minds, Bones, The Pretender, which I love that show so much. If you have never seen The Pretender, totally find it, totally watch it. It is awesome. He has also been on Buffy. He was uncredited in his role on Buffy, though, where he played Doctor. His wife, Jennifer Hammond, is in the music department of Hollywood. She has been an orchestrator 
Cool. Meaning working in the orchestra on 50 different projects in Hollywood. Like a lot of shit. They have twins named Jack and Amelia who were born in 2002. And those names make me smile because they remind me of Doctor Who, even though they were named before Captain Jack Harkness and Amelia Pond even existed. So I will be calling this character Pratt instead of Nathaniel. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Can we call him Shat? You can. Go for it. I'm going to be calling him Pratt instead of Nathaniel, as it makes more sense, because the definition of the word Pratt is stupid or foolish person, and it fits him very well. Yes. Indeed. You can call him Shat if you would like to. Mm. I'm just going to call him Pratt, because yeah. it works. So, Pratt is talking about the city banding together to rid evil, and that Phoebe Halliwell will burn for her crime as a warning to other witches that they're next. This last sign of which is delivered directly into camera. Mm-hmm. And we end the scene on Prue and Piper looking very worried before we go to commercial break. As you do. Indeed. When we come back, we get an exterior shot of the manor from across the street. So we see the swan hitch on the sidewalk for anyone keeping count. Mm -hmm. And there are a couple people walking past the house. And this is when we see the car drive past. The so-called futuristic car. Yeah, it, it's very futuristic looking. I have uh -huh. no idea what kind of car it was. Well, but it, it sounded doesn't matter what kind of car it was. Because they probably just put a bunch of, you know, plastic shit over it so it could drive by and look future-y. Possibly. But that's what I'm saying, is I don't know what kind of car it was, though it looked a bit like a Tesla. Except, like, a Tesla that was dressed like a panda. Well, it was just, it was black and white. I mean, the color doesn't really matter. Yeah, but it's a Tesla dressed like a panda. Okay. Yeah, fun how the prop department took a real long time on that. Who knows, it could have been somebody's car. That they would just job. No, I'm saying like it could have just been somebody's car. They were like, let's just add a thing over it. Who yeah, knows? that's what I'm saying. The prop department decided to take a long time on that. It might not have taken that long though. They put actual effort into it though, okay. unlike we shall soon see. Yeah. Well. Anyway. So Prue and Piper walk into the attic, which now has a bunch of furniture in it. There's a TV and a desk with a typewriter and a lamp on it, a wicker rocking chair. A piano and a cabinet with books and stuff on it. The piano looks like the same piano that's down in the parlor. Possibly. But that's all that you see as they walk in. All of that stuff. Mm. And Prue is, of course, grumbling about them going up to the attic for the Book of Shadows. And hopes that they won't still be doing it in ten years, which I thought was kind of funny. And as they walk past a couple of large white wicker chairs and a couple of tables and dresser things... There was a lot of furniture that they walked past. They walk over to the book stand where the book usually is, but it's not there. Piper notices and tells Prue, and she's like, apparently not, <laughs> because the book is gone. And Prue immediately starts freaking out because they need to find the return spell. And so she starts looking in drawers and then through, like, a chest, and she's asking Piper to help her look for it. And Piper tells her to relax, which has the opposite effect. As it usually does, because never tell someone who's angry to relax. Yeah. No, it just makes them matter. It's yeah. not a good thing. Like, so, I would say the most aggressive thing he would say to them is, breathe. Yeah. Just, like, remind them to breathe, because sometimes they forget. And that isn't about, like, your emotions. That's just reminding you, breathe. Just like, okay, breathe. And then you go on with the plan. And that usually is more de-escalating than calm down. Or relax. Yeah. yeah. So Prue starts going on about being stuck in their future bodies, and then she flicks her arm and, and a flash light. of light. There's a flash of light, and an entire section of the attic is bulldozed yeah, by like, her power. She literally destroys the attic. The well, back wall. Well, not, not the entire attic. Well, but she destroys, she destroys that destroys, entire wing of the attic. Yeah, she in destroys an entire part of the attic. The back wall is completely blown out. It's not the back wall. It's the front wall. It's whatever wall. That's the wall through... There's a window on that wall. Not like the window they made last episode, which was on a wall. This one has a window, an actual window, and you can see the shapeshifter's house across the street. Yeah, yeah, out the blown out wall... You can see the lovely Victorian house across the street. And in the background, you see Quite Tower. Yeah. Which I thought was quite interesting. Trying to figure out exactly how that logistically works. It doesn't. Just saying. It doesn't. Remember, so, Prescott Street doesn't exist. 
indeed. So I saw at least nine different pieces of furniture get blown to pieces. Mm -hmm. But not the table or chairs that we saw just a second ago. Yeah, the those wicker furniture those is gone. big white wicker chairs were non existent. So there's that. Mm -hmm. But that still makes the furniture annihilation quotient 12. 12, which brings our series total up to 17. According to the stunt coordinator for the series, according to IMDb, this is from the season 8 DVD bonus features. I have yet to look at those mm -hmm. because I'm not going to get that far. But according to that, the effect of Prue's telekinesis destroying the attic in this episode was accomplished by rigging every object in the room to strings, which were then tied to a Chevy Suburban truck. Oh my God. And when Prue flicks her hand on camera, the driver was cued to accelerate the truck on the other side of the attic window, which caused all of the tied objects to crash through both the window and the wall, to dramatic effect. To the window. To, to the wall. wall. Yes. We're going to leave that right there. As well we should. Indeed. As well we should. Yeah. Piper jokingly asks if Prue has been working out. And Prue says that it's just a little sample of what 10 years does to their powers. Which I thought was kind of funny. Yeah. Because apparently Prue gets even more destructive with time. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Think of how destructive she was at the pharmacy the first day. Exactly. When she didn't know how to control it. And, yeah. like, now she has control. Like, in 99, she has control. But only control over what she knows how to do. Yeah, indeed. So, yeah. Amp yeah. that up. And, well, yeah, it's like you've got an amp and you accidentally turn it to 11 while you weren't looking. And then you try and play a loud chord. And your ears get blown out. Indeed. So, it's a little sample of what 10 years does to their powers, and Piper replies, and to our attic, and we see that the entire wall has been blown out at this point, and, you know, there's bits and pieces of furniture, there's hat boxes strewn about the floor, because hat boxes are still a thing in 2009, apparently, even though they were barely a thing in 99. Well, it's an old mm. attic. Indeed. And, and there's, there's, like, splinters fucking everywhere. Yeah. It was a big old mess. Oh, yeah. And then Piper looks off camera and we get a dramatic push in on a key that has been taped to the underside of the book stand. And now that the book stand is overturned, we can see it. It's one of those little circle keys that like works for like desk drawers and yeah. safes and stuff. Piper goes over to it and picks it up and Prue says that it's the key to her wall safe at Buckland's. So Piper wonders if that means that the Book of Shadows is at Buckland's and remarks that they've never taken the book out of the house before, which isn't true. Very not true. Just saying. When was the last time they took the book out of the house? In Thank You for Not Morphing. Oh, uh, mm, I don't know if I would technically count that. I'm just saying, episode three. Well, well, three. Well, that was more of a coercion, though. Not the point. They took the book out of the house. And Piper says that they've never taken it out of the house before. And wasn't it just last episode that the book was out of the house? Because it wound up on a fucking rock in the middle of a park. Oh, true. Yeah. So, that never, counts. never taken the book out of the house before. Well, uh, you have a bad memory, my dear. Although the situation kind of necessitated that. Well, true. Like, I would but... say they've never willingly thought, hey, we should take the book out of the house for no reason. True. I will give you that. Very true. They've never in intended for the book to be out of the house for any length of time. Mm-hmm. Indeed. But... Prue says that their future selves must have taken the book out of the house, and then she wonders why. And if she had been paying attention to the news report with Pratt, she would know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. Just saying. But they decide to go to Buckland's to find the book, and as they walk toward the door, Prue apologizes for the mess. And Piper just goes, mm-hmm. And as they walk out, a ceiling lamp and a piece of the ceiling falls down. Yep. And I thought it was hilarious. It was. And this is where we see that the house is outside in the Coit Tower in the background. And then we get an exterior shot of Hobart State Penitentiary. And there are a bunch of people standing outside. And as always, I looked up this place to see if it was real. It is not. But what I did find is that the Oklahoma Department of Corrections does have a Hobart Community Work Center in Hobart, Oklahoma. And Hobart is the capital and most populous city of the Australian island state of Tasmania. But it is the least populated state capital in Australia. Huh. 
So there you go. It was founded in 1803 as a penal colony, just as most of Australia yeah. was. And it is Australia's second oldest capital city after Sydney, New South Wales. And it is the southernmost capital city in Australia, which makes sense because it's in Tasmania, which is an island off the southeast of Australia. Sydney is the capital of New South Wales? New South Wales, Australia. Well, no, it, it's just strange because Canberra is the capital. I thought Canberra was the capital. Hmm. Anyway. Ah, yes. Sydney is the capital of New South Wales, but it's not the capital of Australia. Gotcha. Alrighty then. So, the swashbuckler of old Hollywood movies, Errol Flynn, you know him? He was born in Hobart, Tasmania in 1909. Errol Flynn became a U.S. citizen in 1942 and died of a heart attack in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada in 1959. Aww. Hmm. His son, from his first marriage, was Sean Leslie Flynn. Sean was an actor for a bit, but he decided to quit to become a photojournalist. In 1970, he went with another photojournalist and some special forces units on an assignment in Cambodia and was caught by some communist guerrillas, and they were never seen or heard from again. His mother, Lily Demita, had him legally declared dead in absentia in 1984, 14 years after his disappearance. His nephew was named after him when he was born in 1989. He was named Sean Rio Flynn Amir. And this Sean Flynn is best known for playing Chase Matthews on the Nickelodeon show oh, Zoe 101. Wow. So there you go. Family full of actors. Fun fact. Yes. Canberra is not in New South Wales. It is, in fact, in the Australian Capital Territory, which is tiny, mm. which is kind of like... D.C. How D.C. is technically a state. Mm. Ish. 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 But yeah, it's fun. Oh my god, look at that city name. Tumbarumba. Tumbarumba. I love the names. Kutamundra. Gungadat. Gun... Gunda... Gundagai. Where? Gundagai. Gundagai. Yeah, Gundagai. But yeah. Oh man. Wagga wagga. Wagga wagga. Cool, man. Isn't that a bummer? Cool, man. Coolamon. Coolamon. Anyway. I still like chicken Alaska. <clears throat> Just saying. Ball ball. You don't know? It's so hot in Melbourne. I'm melting. You don't know? Hey. Yeah. Okay. You, you don't know? <laughs> I think they send all the juveniles here to Dunalinguin. Okay. You don't know? The future. It looks bright. Okay. Can you be done now? Okay. I'm done. <laughs> okay. I'm not in maps anymore. I'm done with the map. I'm still waiting for you to somehow interject something. <laughs> I'll interject something when it becomes pertinent. There we go. I knew I knew you had another one. I knew it. I knew it. Inside the prison, Phoebe is in her cell. She is wearing a maroon-colored prison jumpsuit and a collar around her neck that has two prongs on it. So I immediately was like, shock oh, collar. Oh yeah, shock collar. That's that's not going to end well for her. And it is abundantly clear that she has hair extensions. That are not well done at all. You can totally see her short hair peeking through and it does not look good at all. And then we get an overhead shot where we can see that her cell has a bed, a chair, a lamp, and a toilet. And that's it. And there's a door on one wall and a row of windows on another. So kind of sparse, but you know, it's a prison cell, so it's not like it's going to be a hotel room. Phoebe calls out asking if anyone is there and a chime sounds, which is apparently indicating that someone is entering the area. And she asks about getting something to eat and a guy slides a metal tray into the room via a little slot on the floor. It has three piles of beige slop of and varying shades of beige yeah. and no utensils at all. Phoebe remarks on this tray full of goo, as she called it. And as the man leaves, she calls after him and, like, touches the glass. And that gives her a shock on both her hands and her neck. Which is interesting because, you know, glass is non-conductive. So clearly it's got some sort of treatment mm -hmm. that conducts electricity. Indeed. Much like a touchscreen. Yeah. She asks about getting a phone call and we hear the man's voice yell back, Shut, Shut up, up witch. witch! Yeah. It was very... He didn't mean witch. Mean. Yeah. Indeed. No, but he did mean witch. Well, yeah. He did mean witch. Well, yeah. We now cut to Piper and Prue pulling up 
in front of a metal fence in Piper's car. Piper has added a tan jacket to her outfit, and Prue has added a tight black zip-up jacket that is completely zipped up, and I totally thought it was a new shirt at first. <laughs> no such luck. Yeah. I will admit, I enjoy the jacket better than the shirt. Uh-huh. So I had high hopes for just a moment that it was a shirt, but no. Just a mo. Just a mo, but no. It's it's just a jacket. They start walking through the open area, like, plaza that leads to Buckland's, and there's a bunch of people walking around. And Piper starts complaining about Prue having a limo. Well, she's just got the same old car. Yeah. But Prue's Prue like, reminds you her. you have a husband. Yeah. But Piper reminds her that they're getting divorced. Yeah, I got a husband and a kid. Like, yeah, I'm getting a divorce. You might have several husbands. No, kids. kids. Yeah, because, you know, they have, they're in the future. They have no memory of the past ten years. So who knows what, what could have happened. And as Piper starts to say that she doesn't even know who her ex-husband is, a guy holding a cup of coffee bumps into somebody and Piper, out of instinct, freezes him before it spills all over the place. And the freezing sound is, like, reverbed. Yeah. Like it echoes. It and it was bigger. loud. It's a, it's a little deeper, I think. Mm. And then it echoes. Yeah, it was very much like a... Yeah, because this is how they indicate without showing that her power has also gotten bigger. It sounds bigger. Indeed. And they look around and notice that everything is frozen, including... Birds in the sky and water coming out of a hose. And like, they're they're just, like, processing this. Yeah. When Leo steps out from behind someone wearing a gray textured sweater, dark gray pants, and a black jacket, and he's pissed. Yeah, he is quite angry. But Piper doesn't seem to notice that he's angry. She goes to, like, hug him and is like, I'm so glad you're here, and goes to hug him. But he backs away and she's like, what's wrong? And he literally, like berates her yeah. for using her magic like, in public. I knew you'd do something this stupid using your magic in public. Yeah. And she's just like, wait, what? what? Yeah. But Prue whispers a reminder that he thinks they know what's going on. Like, remember, he doesn't know that we don't know kind of thing. And Leo says that they had an agreement to not use magic for Melinda's sake. And she's like, Melinda? And yeah. Like, our, our daughter. daughter. And she gets super weirded out by that and, like, elbows Prue, who is now clued in that Leo is Piper's ex. But it was just that, like, wait, our daughter? Like, what? What? It was it was so funny to yeah. watch her, like, freak out about it. Yeah. And then a woman walks around the corner. She's in a blue suit. You know, I happen to know that. She sees everything is frozen except for these three people in the middle of the square and, and starts just... screaming, Wait! Yeah. Witch. Yeah. And I had to look her up because I'm me and I had to look her up. Her name is Claudia Gold. She only has five acting credits and her character name in this episode is Screaming Woman. I just thought that was funny and had to mention it. So as the girls look around trying to figure out what's going on, they finally see posters that have Pratt on them that say, Rid the evil, turn in witches. Because why they didn't notice those before, who knows? A la convenience. The woman yells out again, pointing at them, and then everyone unfreezes. And Leo tells them, they, you know, we have to get out of here before the witch hunters see them. And they start to run away. And we cut over to the jail, and we get an exterior shot that is slightly further away this time. So now we see that there's slightly more people standing outside. And inside her cell, Phoebe is sitting on her bed, just staring at the food tray. And she hears that same chime for the door or whatever that says that there's somebody coming. And she calls out for her sisters as Pratt walks up to the cell. He's wearing a black suit with a white shirt and a gray tie. You know. He's boring. Mm -hmm. And he tells her that, you know, her sisters haven't visited her before. Why would she think they're going to visit her now? And when Phoebe asks who he is, he apologizes for not visiting her sooner. And he has a great line. He says, executions are a bitch to plan. Logistics, alerting the media, gathering the kindling. <laughs> it, he delivered it really well. And it was kind of funny. Like it was very well done. Phoebe says that she's been thinking and he says that it doesn't matter because justice will be served for her crime. 
And she tries to downplay it by saying, it wasn't really a big crime, was it? Which prompts him to say that she is truly evil because there's no bigger crime than taking a man's life. And she's, you know, visibly upset by this. Mm -hmm. She kind of backs away and sits down in the chair. And she's like, I killed a man? Yeah. He and says that she can't stay her execution. By pleading insanity. Yeah. Or like, memory loss or some shit. Yeah. And says that she only has five hours left to live. And she's like, that's impossible. Yeah. Which because, is my you know, least favorite line in any TV show. Like, that's impossible. Yeah. It's... And they don't go Princess Bride with it either. Like, if they make it a gag, I'd be fine with it. But no. Every single fucking TV show has one instance of this. But they're like, that's impossible. And you're like, it's clearly not. It happened. Indeed. Deal with it. Indeed. But... He taunts her a little bit and says that she's a danger to everything that is good and pure because she killed a man using her power, so now she's going to die. And he says that he wishes he could burn all witches along with her, though he says it as... All of her kind. All of her kind, yeah. He's such a prat. This is why I say the name works. Mm -hmm. He is indeed a prat. And we get a quick little insert shot of a clock... That shows that the time is just before one o'clock. And he says that he will eventually burn all the witches because this is only the beginning. And then he walks away. And we cut to an exterior shot of a boarded up building that has graffiti on the boards. And the largest word is the word dreams written in like bubble letters. Yeah. It's very odd. There's other tags as well. I'll put a picture on the website. One of the, the other things on it was, was the word Dahmer. Like Jeffrey? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. It's the just fuck? It's written in large letters underneath the word dream. And it stood out. That's a little weird. Yeah. We see Prue, Piper, and Leo walking up some stairs. And there's a bunch of people around. And the girls are trying to explain to Leo that they're from the past, but he doesn't believe them. He's like, what? he does the same thing Pratt does a little bit. He's like, this, this is a way to get out of it. Or blah, blah, blah. Like, I don't believe you, even though, you know, you're a fucking white later, Leo. It, it, that can happen. Even though he was the one who turned the book to the future spell. He mm. should fucking remember that in this moment. He should, but... But, you know, he's like, all of these people are in danger because of what Phoebe did. Yeah. And Prue's like, but, how? No, 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 but he says... Because of the witch trials, Phoebe started. Like, Prue asks how she started them. And, and I yeah. asked that, too, because she's not the one that would start witch trials. That's Pratt's doing. Uh-huh. Just saying. Well, but he gets upset again. and Pretends not to know. And this is the no, point. No, no. He gets upset about them oh, pretending yeah, pretends, not to know. Like, don't don't even pretend not to know. Blah, 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 you uh -huh. know. But Piper decides that the way to get him to realize that they're telling the truth is to go up and start making out. Yeah, she, like, grabs his face yeah. and just gives him, like, a super passionate kiss. And, and then, then walks away. Yeah, but she walks away with, like, this look of accomplishment on her face yeah, that was just perfection. She just walks back to Prue, like, perfection. I got it. Yeah. And Leo's like, uh, uh, we haven't kissed like that since... This morning? 1999? Yeah. What? Why would that be a lie? This is so stupid. Like, this convention of making people realize stuff by jumping them and kissing them like and eh, i don't like it yeah i don't like it either but with piper and leo i'm i'm okay with it because they are the true otp this is true uh-huh and so but I'm, she reminds I'm okay him you know it, but... this morning yeah in 1999 when they both had to postpone their date and tells him to trust what he feels. Which is just a corny ass line. Yeah, it is. But he remembers that as the day that he was sent up to the attic to open the Book of Shadows to the future spell. And they're like, uh, Prue's like, whoa, we assumed that was Graham's. Even though they seemed to be surprised when it was happening. They were just surprised so, that it was happening. Yeah, but they didn't look we're, like they thought we it was Graham's. We went over this. I know, but again. like we, they, they didn't say they didn't think it was Graham's. They're just like, it's doing that flippy thing again. But that's the point, is they never mentioned that it, they thought it was Graham's. So. Because usually the book responds to their frustration. They weren't even in the attic when it started flipping. Yeah. I don't know. Whatever. It doesn't really matter. Leo finally believes them about being from the past. Although, other than last episode, but that was a whole wish trial. Phoebe went upstairs and saw the book doing the flippy thing and called the sisters and there was noise going on. 
That was the only time I can think of that it just did that without them expressing some kind of frustration or, you know, being around the book when it started. Okay. Yeah. Whatever. Whatever. So, anyway. he finally believes them about being from the past and not having a clue about the last ten years, so he explains to them that the people around them are hiding because they've been accused of practicing witchcraft, most of them falsely accused, but, they're, know, as you but they're safe underground. Now, here's my question. Are they underground? I don't think they're underground because they had to walk upstairs mm -hmm. to get where they were. Yeah. So, unless they went down and then back up, don't I know. don't get it, but... Whatever. Mm. Prue asks what Phoebe did to deserve execution, and when Leo tells them that she killed Cal Green, they can't believe it. Leo says that she did it because he murdered a friend of hers. But then a technicality in the justice system ended up letting him walk. Yeah, which it, does happen. It does. A lot. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. Although even more unfortunately, what happens is people getting incarcerated and never getting exonerated. Yep. Innocent people in jail. Mm -hmm. Hashtag free Adnan. Hashtag free Joey. Sorry, I watched Undisclosed. Anyway, apparently Phoebe was so outraged that she crossed the line from protecting the innocent to punishing the guilty, which is a line we will hear a few times in this episode, and she used her power to kill him. She got caught and her magic was exposed by Nathaniel Pratt. But we are never told at any point in this episode how Nathaniel Pratt found out that she's a witch how her magic was exposed by him. We are never told that. But Prue says that Phoebe's power can't kill, and Leo reminds her that it's been ten years and their powers have grown, which, again, should have been common sense for Prue, but well, what else? also, like, the examples they've seen of their powers growing is Piper's range getting extended and Prue's force being amplified. So when you look at a premonition, you're like, how does that grow stronger and kill someone? I can understand why they would be confused, because it turns out Phoebe's premonition power isn't the one that killed him. She grew another power. I she has it's... another power, which they didn't even consider, because why would they? True, but I don't think it's necessarily that she grew another power. It was my own personal headcanon. I really think that they all have the powers, like all of the powers that they will eventually have, they have them already, they just haven't figured out how to use them yet. We'll have to discuss that when it happens. Yeah. Season three. Yeah. Spoiler we'll, alert. We'll get there next year. Piper so, tells Leo that they need to go to Phoebe, and Leo's like, dude, you can't. I yeah. checked you out. He doesn't suspect you guys. But I'm not sure how that happened, because, again, he never tells us. But he says that they'd have to use their powers to get to Phoebe, which would just result in them being caught and killed along with her. So Piper tries to reason with him, and we hear the little white lighter chimes, and Leo says that he'll go, and then they try to argue for a moment, and they finally give in, and decide that the best course of action is for them to go to Buckland's, get the book, get the return spell, and meet him back at the manor. And they're, they're about to walk away when Piper turns back and says, wait, Leo, we got, we got married? married? Yeah. And he, he smiles. He smiles, and it was adorable. And then Prue's, like... She has to ruin the adorable because they don't have time for it. You know, she's like, later, you can do this later kind of thing. And they walk away and we get Leo standing there for just a moment longer. Mm -hmm. And then we get an exterior shot that pans down to the Buckland sign. And Prue and Piper inside, they walk out of the elevator and there is a ton of people all wearing black crowding around them. And everyone is talking at once, all directed at Prue. And then a tall redhead comes through the crowd. She's wearing a black dress suit that has a peplum bottom to the jacket, yeah. which was kind of kind of cute. Shoulder pads. Well, yeah. And it has like an inch of white trim on the top of the shirt underneath the jacket, and it was slightly curved. It was an interesting outfit. Mm. And she's also wearing a very large pearl necklace and earrings. The redhead tells everyone that Prue will meet with them all after lunch, and she and Prue walk into Prue's office. She with Piper following close behind, but... So the redhead goes to close the door, and we see... Piper, like, on the other side. No, no. We see Holly. Not Piper, but we see Holly walk to... Okay, so you know how, how the, the office door is two doors? Yeah. So one door is open, the redhead and Prue walk in, and as... The redhead is closing the door. We see Holly walk in front of, like, walk past the door and kind of hide behind the closed door. 
Like, she doesn't yeah. look like she's even trying to walk in behind. She does this, like, weird, like, hide behind. Did, did you... A little bit, yeah. I remember what you are talking it about. Was, it was so weird to see that. Because I was like, that is not a Piperism. Like, that is not a Piper thing that happened. That was a Holly thing that happened. <laughs> like, that, that was not an in-character decision. Uh-huh. So the redhead closes the door, and she starts to talk business, and then Piper enters the room. And the redhead is like, who are you? And she, yeah. and Piper goes, no, no, I'm with her. She just kind of goes, yes? <laughs> like, it was that little, like, the fuck kind of yeah. kind of moment. But all in that one little word of, yes? Mm-hmm. And she's like, I'm with her. And then, and then closes the door. Yeah. And the redhead looks at Prue confused, and Prue's like, that's Piper. My, My sister? sister? And the redhead's like, oh, right, I forgot you had another one. Like, you bitch. Yeah. (laughs) You know? But Piper says that it's okay because she forgot her name, too, which was a smooth way of learning who this person is. And we learn her name is Anne, and she is Prue's personal assistant. Which Prue is very happy with. Yeah. And Prue asks if her, uh, husband calls by any chance. And Anne laughs because Prue doesn't have time for a husband. And then... Tells Piper all about Prue's latest acquisition, which apparently comes with tons of layoffs. And during the meeting with the board, Mm -hmm. apparently Prue's speech included to hell with the little people. Which she thought was particularly persuasive. And Prue pushed it through. Yeah. Hearing that pushes Prue a bit over the edge, and she tells Anne that she needs some private time with her sister, and literally pushes her out of the room and shuts the door behind her. Yeah. It was kind of funny, where it was it was totally a physical, like, okay, leave now, push, push, push. Yeah. It was kind of funny. So Prue wonders what happened to her, because she seems to be a workaholic who's about to fire a ton of people. And on top of that, she's, she's single. single. Yeah. Piper says that she may just be picky, but I have a bit of speculation about Prue's future self. Again, with my own personal headcanon. I think that Prue has no husband and practically lives at Buckland because Andy died. And there's also the possibility of some other boyfriend that has died due to her life. So she's vowed to never let that happen again and has just like thrown herself into her work because that way no one close to her can ever get hurt again. Yeah, that sounds that like sounds that makes it, it's a good headcanon to have. You know, mm-hmm. that sounds like something Prue would do mm-hmm. because after Andy died, she was just like, I don't ever want this to happen again, blah, 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 mm-hmm. you know. So it, it would kind of make sense as to why she's like mm-hmm. putting herself completely into work so much that she now owns the company as well as three others. But it does not explain why she went blonde. Nothing explains why she went just blonde. Just saying. Yeah. Nothing can explain that. No. Nothing at all. Nothing can also explain the fact that this is clearly her old office. Yeah. This is clearly her original office, just with a few clocks up on the wall. Yeah. Showing the other Buckland locations. Yeah, it was a little weird because she says she has this huge office, and then you come into this office and you're just like, the this fuck? Is your, this is your old office, sweetie. Yeah, like, it, this was They could even... have recycled the Rex office. They could have. But who knows, it might have, it might, that, or yeah, something. that set might have already been repurposed, chopped, yeah, that's not the right word. Well, it left out a basket ingredient. <laughs> nice. That wasn't the right word, though. Repurposed, demolished. No. Strike. Stricken. Stricken. From the record. Yeah, because you strike a set. Yeah. Yeah, whatever. Anyway, the other thing that they could have used was Claire's office. Like, isn't Claire's office a little bigger? I don't really remember seeing it. I don't know. It doesn't matter. The point is is that it didn't look like it was a huge brand new office. I think Claire's actually was the repurposed Rex set. Because they they had the door and everything. I don't know. Possibly. I mean, that would make sense. Like, that's where they met the Japanese businessmen last season. Yeah. But that's my point, is they absolutely could have just reused that. Yeah, Yeah, like, there was was many things they could have done to make that bigger and better, and they just didn't. But, whatever. Prue has decided not to dwell on the nightmare that her life will become, and she opens the wall safe and gets out the Book of Shadows, and she's kind of happy to see it, which is funny, because just a few minutes back, she's like, please don't tell me we're still doing this in ten years. (laughs) But now she's all excited and happy about seeing the book, but whatever. Piper says that the return spell should be after the demon with the tusk, which I thought was kind of funny, 
and before the spell to discourage a lover. And they open the book immediately to the to discourage a lover spell, which I thought was kind of interesting. And they flip a few pages. And most of what we see are empty pages for some reason. But we do see them flip past the page for bun yip. Tell me, Kat, what is a bun yip? <laughs> yeah, it caught my eye, so I did have to look it up. The page in the Book of Shadows says, Bunyip is a mysterious creature from Aboriginal land. The Bunyip lives in swamps, lakes, and rivers of the Australian outback. It is believed to bring disease and is roughly the size of a cow. Usually, the Bunyip leaves humans alone, but when their source of food is disturbed, they take humans under the water to their death in revenge. Because, you know, the Book of Shadows is dramatic and shit. Yeah, yeah. So, I looked it up on Wikipedia, and the bunyip is a real thing. Well, it's a mythical creature. Yeah. But it is an Australian Aboriginal... Mythical creature. Mythical creature. So it's a real thing in that it is... Said to lurk thing. in swamps, billabongs. Yeah. Creeks, riverbeds, and water holes. Trace back to the Wemba Wemba. Yeah. Or Wargaia language. Of the Aboriginal people of the southeastern Australia. So it is a real thing in that it is something the Aboriginal Australians believed in. Mm -hmm. So I'll put a link to the Bunyip page on the website. But on that page, there are speculations on a couple of animals that the Bunyip could actually possibly be. And they are fascinating to see. They kind of look like a bear and a pig had a baby. Mm -hmm. And those are... This is the... Dip, dip, diproget, diprotodon, diprotodon, sure, diprotodon, which kind of looks like a bear with a bigger face, with a bigger nose, certainly. Yeah, it's got a koala nose. Is it a marsupial? Yeah. Okay, that yeah. would be why. Yeah. And the zygomaturus. Yeah, which looks like a rhino. Yeah, that one kind of looks like a bear also and a, a rhino marsupial because Australia. Yeah. Then there is the. Nototherium. Nototherium, yes. Sure. Which, Which looks again, like the previous one. A little, but it's kind of... it Again, it kind of looks like... What's the thing? It looks like it's a relative like of a the wombat, kind of Like a wombat, Like, it's like the... Yeah, it's weird. It, it's... Again, it, it kind of... This was the one that, that I it, kind yeah, of made it look like a... Related to wombats. Yeah, where it kind of looked like a bear and a pig had a baby. Uh-huh. But then there is the Palorchestes... Which looks more like an anteater. Mm. Palo chesties, yeah. Yeah. Ancient leaper or dancer. Yeah. So there's those four. I will probably put those links on the website as well so you can take a look at those. It's fascinating to see that there is something that actually might have actually existed and mm. therefore it became this cultural thing. Yeah. But I also found that there is a song about the bunyip. Oh no. Which was apparently played on an Australian kids show called Dot and the Kangaroo. No. I'll put a link to that video on the website as well, but I do warn you that it is super weird and I do not understand how it was shown on a kids show. Mm. So, they flip through the book and they do not find the spell that they are looking for, which they assume means that their future selves have already used it. Which means they're stranded in the future. Indeed. And Piper slams the book closed. And this is when I had the query about the office. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. I still don't understand why they didn't just use a bigger office. But whatever, it doesn't really matter. Anyway, so then we get an exterior shot of the jail again. And then we see Phoebe sitting in her chair as Leo orbs into her cell. She's happy to see him until he says that he's not there to break her out. And she laughs, pats him on the shoulder, and says as she's sitting on the bed that white letters are not a very funny race of people. Yeah, that line was kind of funny. It was nice. So he sits down next to her on the bed and wishes that she could remember what she did in using her witchcraft for vengeance. But, but of course, because Phoebe doesn't know what her current powers are she doesn't believe she could have killed someone she's like my power is passive what did i do premonition him to death yeah it was kind of funny but he tells her that her power has grown and changed and she has to suffer the consequences of her actions 
When she says that she still doesn't believe it, he hands her a newspaper clipping of Cal Green being found dead, which gives her a premonition. Very handy that he had that there. I'm Allah assuming... convenience, he has a newspaper clipping. Well, I'm assuming that he went and got it and Possibly. brought it with him. I mean, that makes sense because he said he was going to go visit her mm -hmm. and he wants to make her realize why this has to happen. Yeah. So, but in the premonition, she has her hands on either... Well, she kind of ducks out of... She, like, he's clearly leaving, like, a Yeah, he's walking room, out of something, and, she and she's out from behind a, a, a stair stairwell, stairwell yeah. and puts her hands on either side of his head, and there's this electricity that goes Yeah, but she's not touching him. She, her hands are, like, yeah. like an inch away from his head, mm -hmm. and this, like, electricity power thing comes out of her hands, and they start floating in the air, and when he dies, he falls to the ground, and there's, like, a little bit of smoke coming off of his uh -huh. head. It was kind of hard to watch, actually. Yeah. So, but fortunately, in the premonition, her uh, extensions looked a lot better than they do right now. Indeed. Because these extensions they gave her do not meld well with her hair when no. her hair is messy. No, it is not but a good But in the premonition, look. everything is straightened, and you can kind of ignore it. Yep. So, as she comes out of the premonition, she is truly upset by what she has seen. And Leo just orbs out without a word. And she stands up and kind of puts her arms out to her sides... Like, in this, like, weird, like, help me kind of thing. But it isn't, I don't know. It was a weird thing. It was like her yeah. arms were just out to her side. And she's, like, yelling for Leo to help her and whatever. And then we go to commercial break because why mm. wouldn't we? And then we have an exterior shot of the Hallowell Manor through a tree in which you are conveniently not able to see the blown out side of the attic because one of the window wells has, like, a fake balcony on the top of mm -hmm. it. And that's covering it up. Absolutely. Prue and Piper are in the living room, and while Piper wonders what is taking Leo so long, Prue is looking through the Book of Shadows, and we will have the most continuity errors ever in this scene. Yeah, certainly by way of density. Indeed. We see a little purple bag in between the pages of the Book of Shadows, but when we get an insert shot of the to bind and erase a memory spells, the bag is gone. Then she turns a page and we see clear as day the return spell, which is the spell they've been searching for, but she seems to not see it at all. I want to know why she doesn't see it, but my headcanon on it, though I may be giving no, the writers too are. much credit, is that like the white lighter founders or whatever Leo called them have cloaked the page from view or something because they you're, have to learn their lesson. You're definitely giving too much credit. Yeah. Because but I was guess what? Trying. No, because Guess what? There are two next to each other of the return spell in this book. Legitimately. When she's flipping through, you see it once, she flips again, you see it again. Really? Yes. I Hold can on. show you the world. I can show you the world. Thanks. That would be nice of you. Mm -hmm. Shining, shimmering, splendid, splendid fuck-ups. Mm -hmm. Little baggy. Piper sits. Prue flips. Return spell, return spell. <laughs> That's hilarious. I know, right? I, I honestly think the prop department did not look at the script. Possibly. Or looked at the script once and went, it's going to be too expensive to make all of these pages. This entire thing just, oh God, it just drives me crazy. Yeah. But Prue says that some of the pages are marked by the top corners being turned down and that all of the pages that are marked are new spells. And this is when we get the insert shot of the book with the door creation spell that has the piece of paper in the top of the corner of the book that wasn't there before, won't be there in the next shot. And Prue mentions that there's a spell to create, create a, door. a door, one to induce slumber, and a glamour to change one's appearance. She turns then, back to the binding and memory racing spells. There's the baggie again. Mm -hmm. And she and that's when she and says that you know some of the spells have little baggies attached. And she takes the bag out and puts it on the table next to the book. And Piper comes to sit over on the couch, picks up and says, you know, they're probably potion bags. And she picks it up for a moment, kind of smells it a little, mm -hmm. and then puts, puts it, it back, back down. down on the table. And then Prue looks at the book and, and flips, flips it again. Flips one page, we see the return spell, flips another page, the return spell again. Yeah, it is an and then exact calls it, copy. And then says, this one's here to create money. And to bend someone's will. Yeah. And then flips it again, and we're back to erase a memory and a binding spell. Yeah, this entire scene is just so infuriating. It is a prop department page fail. Yeah, it is come infuriating. On, like, come on. They don't have to be all fancy and fake illuminated. They just have to be there. 
they literally could have just written out something in script. Like, they didn't need to be all fancified and pretty saying. colors and stuff like that. Like, I don't... As long as they're there, <sighs> they're covered. Yeah. But, no, they had Whatever. to be colored and then, I guess, photocopied so they could be there again. Yeah. I really don't understand why Shannon didn't mention anything. Do you know what I mean? Like, hi, guys, I noticed that I'm supposed to be flipping through this book... And as I'm flipping one page and then the next, it's the same fucking thing. And it's the one spell we're not supposed to find in this book. Is there any way we could have me, I don't know, not be on this page? And they're probably like, don't worry. No one will be able to see it. Yeah, no one will notice it. They weren't counting on us. They weren't counting on Netflix. They weren't counting on people paying attention, apparently. Yeah, because honestly, it's a little grainier in the DVDs, but this one's Mm -hmm. fine. Like, this is a little bit clearer. Yeah, Netflix actually is a little... Clearer than uh-huh. the DVDs, which is a little weird. But they must, they must have run it through something that cleaned it up a little. Yeah, <laughs> not CSI levels, but you know, a little. Yeah. Anyway, so Piper wonders why the spells are marked, and Prue then pulls out a piece of paper that was the paper that was in the corner in the earlier shot, which she says is a prison map. Well, it's labeled Hobart. Yeah, but it's also hand drawn. True. So there's that. Yeah, who knows. And then Prue realizes that what connects all of these dog-eared spells is a plan to break Phoebe out of jail. Yeah. But her She's problem... bothered because some of these spells are clearly for personal gain. And Piper's like, we wouldn't do that. But Prue's like... We might for Phoebe. Yeah, our, our future, future selves, selves would for Phoebe. And then Leo walks in through the front door and Piper is happy to see him until she realizes that he's alone. And thus has left Phoebe at the prison. Yeah, she questions him about Phoebe not being with him, and he says that she's in prison where she belongs. Prue stands up and gets onto the be mad at Leo train. Yeah. But he's like, no, Phoebe has to die to stop all of this, all of these persecutions. Which, the girls are not fond of that answer. And And just as Prue is, like, firing herself up, Piper freezes Leo with just a finger. Yeah, single finger in the air, and and then tells Prue that she needs to relax because we can't break any more of the house. Yes. We go back and sit down. Again, telling someone who's angry to relax. Yeah. Yeah. And Prue distracts herself by asking if Leo's going to stay frozen. And Piper says, if he (laughs) he knows knows what's what's good for him, him, he'll he'll stay frozen. frozen. It was a great moment. Yeah. Because you could just tell that this has been building in future Piper. Yeah. (laughs) You know, and it's coming out in past Piper in that moment of, like, if he knows what's good for him, he will. They decide to go with the plans their future selves have already come up with. Because, hey, it's a lot less work. Exactly. And so Prue goes to the book and she pulls out, like, rips the binding spell. Well, it's not so much rip as the page kind of slides on out. Well, it wasn't even sewn in. Yeah. There's no rip. It was just really tightly tucked. Yeah, but now there's no spell next to it now. What? Really tightly tucked. What? Buffalo Bell. Silence of the Lambs. I, yeah. Okay. Someone will get this. Someone will get this. Okay. So she pulls off the binding spell, and there's no spell next to it now. Mm-hmm. When just a moment ago, there was the erase a memory spell yeah. next to it. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So, and clearly, whatever continuity master they were didn't paying, have. who they were clearly not paying enough because he wasn't doing his fucking job, left. And, and just stopped giving a shit. Yeah. yeah. So I do think it's kind of interesting that when she pulls out the binding spell, we see a glimpse of the time acceleration spell that was used in the season one finale. (laughs) So why they couldn't have put that one in instead of the return spell, who fucking knows? Mm -hmm. I swear, this entire scene just makes me hate Mm -hmm. everything in life. Then we cut over to the pen yet again, and we have the exterior of the penitentiary, but it's a shot of armed men on the roof. Yeah. So that's something different, I guess. And we see Pratt on TV talking about the blight on everything good in the world being extinguished, and we pull back, like, through the TV, yeah, out of the TV, to see that a guard is watching the TV just outside Phoebe's cell. Yeah, it's like one of those little portable carrying TVs. Yeah, which is interesting that they still that, had those in 2009. Like like the one TJ was watching sports on in Gilmore Girls at the Ren Fair. He had it, like, tucked under his blanket because it was small enough. Okay. It just reminded me of that. Yeah, I could see that. And then it pans over into Phoebe's cell, and we see that she's sitting on the floor next to her bed... And we cut back to the TV where Pratt is yelling, Tonight the witch will burn! 
And then we end on Phoebe still sitting on the floor next to the bed because... Looking haunted. Yeah. And then we cut to Piper and Prue in a silver car that Prue is driving. As they pull up outside a blue house. Yep. Which is apparently Leo's house. Yeah. I just want to know whose car that is. Because we have established that Piper is still driving the same old car and Prue has a limo. So where this silver car came from... Maybe it's one of Prue's company cars when she doesn't want to ride in a limo. Maybe. When she wants to ditch her fussy assistants. Maybe. But there's no... Yeah, there's no explanation. Explanation at all uh-huh. for it, so. But Phoebe apparently has less than an hour, and Prue's like, do it, now or never, baby. Yeah, so Piper gets out of the car, and we cut to her looking through the window of the house, watching little Melinda playing tea party inside, and she's holding the binding spell. And, okay, I love the idea that Leo now has a house. Yeah. Like, he has to be in the physical world a lot for the kid, and he... He went and got a house. And I think that's adorable. Yeah. Though at this point, we don't know that he doesn't have a house. Well, we know, like, he's always gone. And, you know, white lighters can orb fucking anywhere. And he always gets these magical, like, heavenly calls. And so it it's just interesting to me. Yeah. No, I, like, I agree with you. But at this point, we don't know that he doesn't have a house already. So, I mm. mean, yeah. Whatever. Speaking of, Leo orbs in behind her, and she realizes that she can't bind Melinda's powers, even though their grandmother did it to them for protection. Again with the grandmother yeah, thing. It's weird. It's so weird. Mm-hmm. But I think it's only weird to us because we know... It's Grams. That it's Grams. And in later... I mean, they never really say it to her because, you know, her name to them is Grams. Yeah. Really, the only time they ever say it is when they're talking to other people, and, you know, Grams isn't entirely indicative of grandmother. I guess. So I can see them using it to clarify, but it's still silly because Leah knows who she's talking about, so. Yeah, it's just odd. Uh, And Leo isn't mad, even though she froze him and left him at her house, and is, you know, on her way to break Phoebe out. Yeah. But he understands that she's finding it difficult to bind Melinda's powers. And he's like, you don't have to. I know we agreed already that I would take care of her Mm -hmm. and protect her if anything happened to you. Yeah. And Piper then asks if he clipped his wings for her, but he says that she wouldn't let him. Which sounds very Pipery. It really, really does. He also says that they tried to make it work and then all this stuff happened, but that they were very happy, at least for a time. Yeah. And, and she, she turns toward him and she's wiping tears from her eyes. And asks if he's going to stop them. And he's like, I can't because I understand why they're doing about it. But we'll do what we always do best. Talk about it later. Yeah. And he does this like adorable little frowny face. Aww. It was so cute. And then Piper gets back in the car and Prue looks upset. And for a moment, I had forgotten where this was going. Mm-hmm. And I... I was like, why is she upset that Piper didn't do this? And then Piper asks what's wrong, and Prue's like, I have no one to say goodbye to. If if we die today, my tombstone would read, Here, Here lies Prue, Prue. She, she worked, worked hard. hard. But Piper says that they're not going to die, and they're going to find a way to get back to 1999 and create a new future. But Prue, of course, doubts her, because according to Phoebe's premonition, they fail. And Piper reminds her that their future selves fail, but they've still got a shot. Mm-hmm. So Prue agrees, and they buckle up. And, and Piper, Piper just throws the spell behind her into the yeah, backseat. Yeah, she kind of just chucks it in the backseat of the car as they drive off to get Phoebe. And I just thought it was hilarious. Because you've realized that witches are being persecuted, and you've now just chucked a spell into the backseat of the car where anyone can see it. Yeah. You know, just saying. So then we get another exterior shot of the jail again, and the same people are outside because they've been now standing there for hours. Mm-hmm. Because they didn't take more than one photo of the outside, really. Yep. Well, more than two, at least. Anyway, so we see Prue and Piper running underneath a bunch of prison guards with guns. Prue is holding her shoes, which I thought was kind of funny. And then they make their way through some high-voltage boxes before coming upon a very, very large, large concrete, concrete wall. wall. They decide to use the create a door spell here, so Piper draws an imaginary door on the wall with her finger. That apparently sounds like chalk. Yeah, or glass cutting. It was, there was definitely a screeching sound as she was doing it. Scraping, more like. Yeah. And as she draws this door, 
You it s- goes above her head. Yeah, she she draws like her hand all the way up so that it is above their head by at least a few inches. It might be a little narrow. Yeah. But... Well, Prue does joke about it being kind of small for them. And then she recites the spell, When you find your path is blocked, all you have to do is knock. Piper knocks on the wall, and the door opens smaller than the opening she actually drew. And because really it is CGI. Yeah, because it is now a couple of inches shorter than her head, and they have to duck to walk inside, and then it closes behind them. That entire scene is also annoying to me, but for different reasons than the last scene. Then we get a quick little cut to Phoebe as two guards are putting handcuffs on her. And then we cut back to Prue and Piper coming up a tunnel. And as they turn the corner, they encounter a guard that has his gun pointed at them. He yells at them to freeze. And Piper says, that sounds like a good idea. Yeah, so she freezes him. And we hear like an echoing of the sound, that like reverb sound echoes even more. Mm -hmm. And they continue on toward Phoebe's cell and we get an insert of the clock reading 550. So now we have 10 minutes left. And when they get to her cell, it's empty. So they're too late. We cut to... (laughs) Yeah. We cut to Phoebe walking and we hear chains clinking as she walks. And we see Pratt standing just behind a gate and there's a room behind him where the floor bursts into flame. And we cut back to Phoebe and apparently in the light of the fire, we can see that they've kind of put some wrinkles on her face to show age. But we haven't seen them at all before this moment. So, yeah. And we cut back to see Pratt and we see that the room that was on fire has a very large metal pyre in it. It honestly looked more like a trellis. Yeah, a little bit. It was it was like just a conical, kind of a conical freestanding trellis. Yeah, it was kind of just four metal uprights and then three connecting rings. So it really does kind of look like a trellis as opposed to a pyre, but with one last look on Phoebe's face, we go to commercial break because why wouldn't we? Mhm. And this is the last commercial break. It is indeed. Episode. Indeed, indeed. And we come back to an exterior shot of the penitentiary yet again, where many people are now milling about with cameras and boom mics, because a lot of people have showed up in the last couple of seconds. And then they pan left to see the sign, in case you forgot where we are. Inside, Phoebe is being attached to the metal pyre, and Pratt quips, I love the smell of burnt witch in the morning. Phoebe says that she's paying for her crime and that he'll have to pay for his crime sometime. And he, he just af- kind of laughs and says, remorseless till the end. Yeah. How, how is that remorseless? She's like, I'm paying? Yeah. Dude. Like. Yeah, I don't know. It was mostly just a fuck you. Yeah, kind of. And then he turns to the people watching and he says something ultra douchey that I'm not even going to bother going into. And then Prue and Piper enter the room and Piper freezes everyone. Prue runs over and unties Phoebe, but Phoebe tells them that they have to leave because her future self deserves to be there. Piper, of course, tells her not to be ridiculous because she killed a killer and, you know, he got what he deserved kind of thing, you know. Prue tells her that this is Pratt's personal crusade and he's never going to stop hunting them, which is completely true. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of annoyed with Leo, who's like, Phoebe has to die, so this will all stop. Why does he think it's going to stop? Just saying. Dunno. I digress. I'm a no-no. Exactly. I'm a no-no as well. Prue says that if anybody should be punished, it should be Pratt. And she gets ready to use her power by staring at her hand, which I just thought was a funny little insert thing. Well, it was more of a realization like, hey, I've got a power. I I should use it. Yeah, but she literally just kind of stares at her hand. It was weird. But Phoebe tells her not to become a murderer, too, and she starts to cry. And Piper's like, you know, you killed a bad guy, but Phoebe tells her that the wrong thing done for the right reason is still the wrong thing. And she's doing a lot of good cry acting at this point. Yeah, it was quite Uh, good. it It was effective. It was nice. And she's realized that she crossed a line. Phoebe uses cry. It is super effective. (laughs) Nice. She realized that she has crossed a line, and again we get that moment of punishing the guilty instead of protecting the innocent. Mm -hmm. So that's twice now. Yeah. Then they all start crying, 
and Prue tries to get her to go with them, but Phoebe takes their hands and says that they were sent there for a reason, but it wasn't to stop her from dying. It was to understand why she has to die and that they have to let her die and that she doesn't want to die, but she doesn't want them to die because of her. There was a lot of talk of die. Yeah. A lot of talk of dying in that one paragraphy mm-hmm. time. Yeah, they really princessed it up. Indeed. Then they hug and she kisses them and tells them that she loves them. And then she goes back to stand against the pyre. Now reminding you that she's not locked in anymore. No, she's just standing there. She's just standing there. And everyone unfreezes and the flames are turned on. So Phoebe's burning to death. And then we get an exterior shot of the manor going again through day and night cycles. And Prue and Piper end up back in the living room. Still hugging each other, but now back in their... 1999 their clothes, yeah. yeah. The outfits they had at the top of the show. Indeed. And still, like, clearly, visibly upset, like, they both appear to have just been crying. Yeah, and they're both kind of a little confused for a moment. And then they remember what they went through, and they call out for Phoebe. And at first she doesn't answer. Yeah, they're a little they, worried. They walk a little around. They and, they start to walk out, then, out of the room as Phoebe then, walks into the room, yeah. and she has been clearly crying. And they hug And we learn that Phoebe could feel the flames on her skin before they wound up safe and sound back at home. Piper, wondering when they showed up back at home, turns on the TV because that's apparently the easiest way to tell. Yeah. And up pops that announcement about Cal Green. Yeah. Now, I want to know. Here's my question. They fucked up. It it is a complete fuck up because when Phoebe turned on the TV originally, it was two channels away at least. Yeah. From where this report is. And they realize... They, meaning like the White Lair Council or some shit, mm-hmm. sent us back because they didn't even use. Yeah, the they didn't even. Spell. They didn't even have Either the return, of the return spell. spells that were in the book. Yeah. Uh huh. Either of the two or three, mm-hmm. depending return yeah. spells. And yeah. Piper wonders why they weren't sent back to you know maybe the day Phoebe killed Cal because if the point was them stopping Phoebe from killing him. Then uh, well, to stop Phoebe from being burnt to death. Because yeah. she killed him, then yeah. they would have gone there. Yeah. But then you hear a dog bark from the front. Uh-huh. So they run to the window. Piper opens the window and remarks, this guy still hasn't learned his lesson, and she freezes him. And then behind Piper and Prue, Phoebe is off in the background, slightly out of focus, and she says, maybe we haven't either. Yeah, because she thinks that this is why they were sent back to this moment in time, because this was the first time they used their magic for revenge. Piper, of course, says it's a harmless little thing. But but Phoebe quotes the domino effect. Yeah, once you break the small rules, it's just a matter of time before the big ones are next. But personally, I think that's kind of bullshit. That's like saying that weed leads to harder drugs, when When in reality, for most people, it just leads to munchies and sleepiness. Yeah, for for me. In fact, most people... Who do weed? Don't even continue doing weed. Yeah. For me, weed led to no good things, but I'm not sure that's a story I want to tell because it is still an illegal substance in the state where I live, and I don't know yeah, about what the statute, statute of limitations? limitations is. I don't know. It's not It's not unlimited, so. Yeah. It's probably less than a rape case, so five years? Don't know. But Whatever. that's that's a story for another day, another year, maybe. Mm-hmm. We'll, we'll see. Maybe even another <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Who knows? Uh-huh. But then Prue looks outside, sees the guy, and realizes that's yeah, Pratt. Yeah, that's that's Pratt. And as he walks away with his dog, Piper wonders if they should follow him, which I thought was kind of interesting. But Phoebe says that their little act of revenge might have been what made him want to seek his own revenge. But, you know, hopefully he won't start the future witch trials. And this is where we get the third instance of... The line of protecting the innocent as opposed to punishing the guilty. Yeah. Which, okay, the idea that you put some shit on the guy's shoe. Yeah, I don't... And then he decided that he was going to have everlasting revenge on you. It's a bit crockery for me. But see, it's not even just that. It's getting poop on your shoe from your own dog somehow makes you think witches exist and you want to kill them all. Like, I don't... There is literally no like, there's sensical of... reasoning as to why that interaction, this little moment of my dog is shitting on these girls' sidewalk. Hey, look, the dog poop that was there is now on my shoe. Must be witchcraft. Yeah, there's no connection between 
the dog shit and the girls. Yeah. So yeah, like I can I can see possibly if he connected the dots, it would have been a series of escalations leading to him literally going on a witch hunt. But maybe there it's tenuous at best, and really the point is not that he connected the dots. The point is that they use their powers for revenge, yeah. even if it's a little it was, thing. Yeah, even yeah. if it was little and was just a little bit personal gainy, they they shouldn't have done it. Mm-hmm. And consequences can come from the strangest places. Yeah. So sure. yeah, that was the point, not, oh, this particular guy was the one. Because he's an asshole and he lets his dog shit everywhere. Yep. But Piper, of course, says that they should keep an eye on him just in case, and Prue agrees. So this is yet another instance of being given a character that they are like, yeah, we'll keep in touch about this person, and then we never hear from them again. They never get mentioned again. I'm still kind of salty about little Max, mm-hmm. our little witch dude, who is never mentioned again. Mm-hmm. I'm, I have... As we've been doing and this, Aviva. I'm yeah, I'm I'm a little less salty about Aviva, though I'm still kind of salty about it. I am more salty about Max though, because Max was a witch. They could have maybe gotten his help at some point in the future, you know, like the final season or something. They they're just like, hey, we we have this thing, we need some help. Hey, you remember that kid that we saved, you know, six years ago? Mm. <laughs> Whatever. But I digress. So they walk away from the window. And Prue picks up the phone to call off work because they need to make a lot of changes if they want to avoid the future they just came from. Mm-hmm. Piper's like, oh, the future wasn't all bad. Prue was Miss Fortune 500. Yeah. And I had a beautiful little girl. Yeah. And Phoebe is, of course, surprised by this news that Piper has a daughter or had a daughter, will have a daughter. Yeah. You know. No, no, no. <laughs> Prue's the one who has trouble with tenses. <laughs> yeah. But Piper says that she'll give her details later. And Prue says that they can still make the good things happen as long as they make the right choices. (laughs) And Piper is excited about the prospect of her and Leo actually getting together and being together. Which which again surprises Phoebe because she's like, wait, Leo? And right then the doorbell rings. And Piper's like, (laughs) speak speak of of the the angel. angel. And she jumps up to get it. And she answers the door to Leo. Grabs him by the shirt. Yeah. And, and gives, gives him, him a passionate, passionate kiss. kiss. He says that he would have settled for a nice hello, which was cute. And she says something like, didn't anyone ever tell you not to settle? And he goes, that's a good lesson. I you should learn a lot of those today. Yeah. He tells her that he didn't know that they were going to be sent to the future. And he doesn't know what happened to them there. But he was told that they had something to learn and that they must have learned it because otherwise they wouldn't have been brought back. And then he says that they're making him work and it's implied that he is breaking their date. Now, okay, so the chronology of this is interesting and it further cements the idea for me that white lighter consciousness exists in a higher dimension. Okay. Because, I mean, honestly, like, this is before he would have been ordered to go to the future spell. Yeah. He knew that they were going to make him work, but, you know, you never know what that's going to be. Right. But at this point, he knows not only were they supposed to go to the future, they've been there and been back, but it's before he was asked to do the future spell. Yeah. So I honestly think that they might be, like, we're creatures of the fourth dimension. We can't operate in the fourth dimension, except in a very limited way. Mm. But, you know, three dimensions we get real well. I think white lighters might be more of a fifth dimension creature. Maybe. Because, you know, when he's frozen, he's still, his cognitive ability is still going, which is why after he gets unfrozen, he's in a completely different sentence from where he started. Yep, as we have seen. Yeah. Because he's still thinking about it, even though he's not getting any input. Mm-hmm. It's still going. Yeah. But, like, this would be another example of that, even though it's been moved back to the point before he took it to the future spell and the return spell. He still knows this is something that happened. Yeah. Because time is different for white lighters. And so I I like, it's probably coincidental for the writers at least. Maybe, yeah. But I like like the idea of it. Yeah. It's a trope that works. Yes. And it's well done. Mm Mm-hmm. Although, honestly, I prefer the medium rare. Anyway, so. Piper's like, this is always going to be a problem for us, this whole rain check thing. Yeah. And he says that he's willing to work on it, so she tells him <laughs> not to forget that he said that, and then they kiss passionately and we go to the end credits. Oh, It was so cute. It was super cute. It was super sweet, and I enjoyed it immensely. So, that's that episode done. Mm-hmm. 
So we are on to our ratings portion. Would you like to go first? Didn't I go first last time? I don't know. Uh, sure. I'm giving it a six and a half out of ten prop department page fails. Six and a half, huh? Yeah. Why six and a half? There were just too many fucking continuity errors. All right. I just had too many problems with it. Like, obviously it's got a good message, but, I mean, come on. You literally put poop on a guy's shoe, turn around, and have a premonition of you dying, and you don't think the two are related? Yeah. Well, it, it was, it, like, from well, a story, no, I, per, well, from I a story understand. hang on, from a story perspective, it's a little ridiculous. Yes, but I understand. And handed But I understand not necessarily thinking the poo flicking is related since the premonition came from a TV story about a baseball player. So I understand. Well, also, the insert bit of the justice. That was also rather ham handed. Well, yeah. The cocoa was random, then there was justice, and then cow green. And, yeah. Okay, like. Even if Phoebe didn't connect the dots, the audience is just like, oh, oh, it's because you flicked the poo, didn't you? Like, for the audience, it would be immediate, which just makes it an uninteresting story. Well, because you already know the reason. Like, okay, well, she was having a problem with Cal Green, so something to do with Cal Green. And, you know, the thing before, it was justice, and she just flicked poo on the guy's shoe and said, hey, yeah, it's not personal gain. Like, I can see the audience going, oh, they're trying to indicate a slippery slope. Yeah, but you're giving the audience a little too much credit. I don't think I am. A little. I think they would definitely connect it subconsciously and then... Maybe subconsciously, but not... And then consciously, like, another ten minutes later. Yeah. Once they go to the future, mm. then that connection becomes a little more apparent. Yeah, the second that Pratt says, oh, you killed a man, they'd be mm. like, oh, did she kill Cal, didn't she? Yeah. Like, it, it's just... I know. It's not good storytelling. All right. That's fine. Because mm -hmm. you want, the, the whole idea with writing is that you want your audience, if you're writing a mystery or any kind of mystery, like this would be an elemental sort of subplot mystery thing, you would want the audience to figure it out about like a page before the character. Maybe. This is definitely more than a page. Yeah. Like if this were written out in narrative form, it would be painfully obvious. Yeah. Pretty soon. Yeah. So yeah, that's why I gave it a six and a half. All right. It doesn't completely suck, but it ain't good. I gave it an 8 out of 10 uncertain futures. Because you know me, it had Leo in it, therefore it got an additional point. Mm -hmm. Because it would have been a 7 due to just all of the continuity errors. Mm -hmm. But it is indeed an 8 because of Leo. So that brings us to our outfits. Mm -hmm. There's not really much of a choice here, but which was your favorite? Phoebe's shirt from the top of the show. Yeah, I enjoyed Phoebe's 1999 outfit the best. Mm -hmm. For Piper, I liked the 2009 outfit without the jacket. Because it was an interesting shirt with a little yeah, strappy thing. Yeah, they're just like, how can we make this look futuristic? Stick Add a, a strap, strap on it, yeah. <laughs> Put a strap on. There you go. And for Prue, I liked her 2009 outfit with the jacket completely zipped up. Because nope, nope, nope. I liked it better. Nope, I'm going 99 on that one. That, that whole leather ensemble did not appeal to me in the least. I just didn't... With or without the jacket. I just didn't but think... But let's face it, the hair definitely influenced me on that. Yeah, but it I just... a shit wig. Yeah. I just didn't enjoy her 99 outfit, like, at all. And there was only the two outfits to choose from. So, therefore, by process of elimination, 2009 outfit it is. Mm. Leather ensemble, if you will. But that's it. We're done for another week. Mm -hmm. So it is now time for social media stuffs. Mm -hmm. As always, you can find pictures and links and stuff at charmchats.com. Uh -huh. You can email us at charmchats at gmail.com. You can get us on Facebook, Instagram, Patreon. And Snapchat. And Snapchat at charmchats. And you can get us on Twitter and Tumblr at charmchatspod. So please, get in touch with us. We love to hear from people. Yeah. We do. also love to talk to people. Indeed. Which may not be a surprise to people because we have a podcast. Yep. So until next time. Sleep tight. Don't let the warlocks bite. Bye. Bye. Phoebe, Piper, and Pooh, they've got evil to sleep.
sleigh and some potions to brew. So we'll see where it's at. It's sweet with Kendra and Cat on John.